It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Thanks to Jason Snell for filling in for me last week. I'm back. And, man, we have a great show for you. Amy Webb is here. Christina Warren. We're going to talk about the arrest of Julian Assange. Can you defend him? Maybe you can. We'll also talk about Amazon. They're moving into your house. And baby's first Chinese internet. How Amy keeps her child safe online. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 714, recorded Sunday, April 14th, 2019. Baby's first Chinese internet. This Week in Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Molecule. Molecule is reimagining the future of clean air, starting with the air purifier. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule.com and enter the promo code TWIT1. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. It's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to ExpressVPN.com slash TWIT. And by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at WordPress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at WordPress.com slash TWIT. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Aloha from Hawaii East. <laughs> I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks to Jason Snell for filling in for me last week. Back from vacation, as you might have noticed. And we thought we'd have some fun this week with two of my favorite people. Amy Webb is here, our futurist from amyweb.io. She is the founder of the, uh, the, the Future Today Institute, professor of strategic foresight at NYU Stern School, and the author of two wonderful books, The Signals Are Talking, where she explains how you can do her job, and then The Big Nine, where she shows how you can't do her job. Only Amy Webb can do her job. This is the <laughs> new book and really, really good. Hi, Amy. Welcome. Hey, Leo. Welcome back. It's good to have you here. Uh, also joining us, she's been all over the world, Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Developer Advocate at Microsoft. She's been on the Ignite Tour to Milan and Dubai mm -hmm. and uh, all over the place. Hello, Christina. Hey, Leo. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome back to you, too. Thank you. All right. You're not done, though. No, I will be in Stockholm next week, and then I will have a few weeks off, but Build is in between that time, and then I will be in Mumbai at the end of May. And wow. then, knock on wood, um, I will not be traveling internationally for a little bit. So, What do you do on these, these, um, these Ignite tours? They're for, for developers, right? Yeah, they're for developers and for um, IT professionals um, and uh, operations people. And so I actually give two talks um, at each stop is, is what I've been doing. So um, I help out with the opener, which is kind of like what we're doing in lieu of a keynote where we kind of show off some of the different things that that you can do with um uh, you know uh, Visual Studio Code with Live Share and and some of our different CI CD um, uh, uh, interfaces and then I give a talk on um, introduction to Azure um, and cloud computing so it's kind of like a high level 101 um, you know course for people who maybe aren't familiar with cloud computing um, and especially kind of the Azure ecosystem it goes into things like you know the differences between containers and VMs and talks a little bit about what serverless computing is and things like that. And then I do a talk on um, introduction to Azure networking, which is talking basically about how uh, various uh, networking, virtual networking, um, a load balancer um, and, and other types of services work on Azure and how people can, you know, use that to connect their on-prem stuff to what might be in the cloud or um, and, and, uh, and all that. So, Well, it's great to have you both on. I followed the tech news the whole time I was in Kauai. Uh, <laughs> I Why? did. I Why know because <laughs> I would knew that I was coming back today and I thought oh, I don't want to not know what happened. But I wasn't I, I admit a little shocked uh, to turn on the TV a couple of days ago and see Julian Assange carted away from the Ecuadorian yeah. embassy in uh, London looking I'm I'm afraid a little uh, like a little haggard. 
Well, I think he was going for the Jesus thing. I don't know what it was. He almost was like blessing people as as they took him out. Um, there he is. Uh, yeah. So, but there are two takes on this. The U.S. government says, "Oh no, we're not we're not going after him for what he published. We're going after him because he hacked and encouraged hacking. He helped Chelsea Manning." break in to a classified system. They have emails saying, uh, my team is working on it. That's the smoking gun, apparently. Uh, on the other hand, it's pretty obvious that the minute they arrested Chelsea Manning, they were gunning for Julian Assange. WikiLeaks published a stunning video, which I vividly remember, called Collateral Murder, showing U.S. drones used on civilians, or actually it was military helicopters, on civilians and journalists and uh this is where wikileaks really became famous uh, mm -hmm. more recently of course uh in the election in 2016 uh, julian went from a hero of the left to enemy of the left when he uh on, we don't know he, he he published emails from the democratic national committee we don't know if he was acting on uh russia's behalf or not but in this in any case that's not what he's been arrested for he's been arrested for hacking I'm well, the Obama administration, I think, um, he was public enemy was, number one for the Obama administration. He yep. was, but, but there was a, I think, a very salient reason that the Obama administration f did not pursue charges against him, and that was because we don't have a clear definition of what constitutes speech in an era of big tech, and so if they were to uh, pursue charges. Um, and if somebody were to claim that he was a publisher doing an act of journalism, then the First Amendment um, protects him. Then, well, I mean, it may or may not have protected him, but it, it opened up uh, an arena for discussion that I think we, not me, but like the, the people who were involved weren't yet ready to have. Look, because at, Nixon didn't like didn't like Daniel Ellsberg because he leaked the Pentagon Papers. But without the Pentagon Papers, we wouldn't have known the true state of the Vietnam War. That was protected. The New York Times and the Washington Post published it. I hope you saw the the, the, the movie about it, uh, the Post. Uh, it was very dramatic. They tried to break into a, uh, to Assange Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. They wanted him, but they never they never got him because. Right, I think it, this is. Don't is this, you think this is, is this, different though? Well, it, that's I, my question. Is this different? Here's a good article by James Ball uh, in the Atlantic. You don't have to like Julian Assange to defend him. The, ask, the effort to extradite and prosecute the WikiLeaks founder threatens the free medium, uh, which is in contrast to the Motherboard article we showed earlier, which says it's, it's, a, it's not about free press. It's about hacking. The, it's a, look, it's, prob, it's trouble, troubling. It's problematic. Assange is a problematic person. But uh, that's the whole point of free speech. You have to defend. But it raises a worst, really good point, which is we don't have... There, there are a lot of fundamental questions that unfortunately we don't, we, we are not yet discussing in this country because our country in order to have those conversations requires a lawsuit first, right? To have the conversations where, where we get to action. So we have a lot of questions around what is speech? What constitutes yeah. speech? If it's been automated, are, are we, you know, are, are the algorithms to blame? Is the data to blame, uh, you know, f from that to um, who owns your face? Uh, who owns your biometrics? Um, and you what, think the you proper know, place is for the courts to decide? No, I, I don't think so. But um, that, unfortunately, is the way that democracy, you know, the, the, the <laughs> of democracy, yeah. it does in this country. Now, in other countries, uh, they've just jumped ahead to regulation. But this is a this is a problem that's that's not going to go away. I should point out that the reason Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy was not because of U.S. charges, but Swedish charges against him for rape. Uh, those charges uh, were dropped, um, but now he's arrested for uh, uh, on uh, basically uh, the the London Metropolitan Police arrested him on the behalf of the United States. They're going to extradite him uh, because he was indicted in the U.S. for this for this hacking. At the at the end of his uh, piece, Ball says. Um, Assange might be an a hole. Scratch that. Assange is an a hole, but we're going to have to stand up for him anyway. I don't. I'm. I have very mixed feelings about this. I think he did a lot of good with collateral justice or collateral murder, rather. Um, I think he was probably a Russian cutout uh, in the 2016 election. 
So uh, there's that. On the other hand, I think... I mean, there, there are... I, I don't know. I, you well, know we I, knew I, the I, minute he published collateral, collateral murder, he would be... There would be trumped up charges against him of some kind. I thought. Yeah, I, so I've had I've had two jobs, two careers. I've been a futurist for 15 years, and the years before that, I was a foreign correspondent. So I, I worked at the Wall Street Journal and at Newsweek. And here's what I would have to say: you know, there are plenty of cases like the Panama Papers, where there's been widespread collaboration and journalists working for the public interest, um, and and much like the Pentagon Papers, releasing information, you know, in a to to shine the light on on corruption. Um, I think we need some kind of, you know, we Assange makes it sound, and WikiLeaks make it sound like um, this is all open and and it, it, through through that openness and freedom comes justice. But it's not entirely open. There's still an arbiter, and you know what I mean. Yeah. It's, so it's and it is and this and it's is an untrained arbiter who's who's co-opted by other governments in oh, his own great. ways. <laughs> uh, I mean, Chelsea Manning. Uh, her sentence uh, was. What did Obama do? He didn't. He didn't. He commuted it, right? He didn't. No, he, he didn't he, he pardon her. her. He commuted her sentence. Right. He said, "You've served enough time. We're going to let you out." Um, clearly, uh, people were very angry at WikiLeaks for releasing that, but I think it. I think it's very analogous to the Panama Papers or the Panama, Pentagon Papers. These were government leaks, but they were of information that was in the public interest. And there's also timing. So while um, there were certainly revelations about lives that were put in danger, lives that were lost once yeah. that information was dumped. Yeah. Um, however, the there there were instances of new people whose lives were put in, say, you know, in danger. Um Again, this is these are the kinds of things that a journalist or a team of journalists working together would. Um, no, Snowden did it responsibly, right? Yeah. Snowden took the material and gave it to a number of reputable right. publications yes. and said, "You need to vet this, and you need to put it out in an appropriate way." Because I'm not capable of doing that. Assange did the opposite. In fact, I think what you're thinking about that was really troublesome, troubling was the American diplomatic cables that were leaked that mm -hmm. had the names of American agents and it put them in, in grave peril. Um, That's right. And just because the documents are leaked doesn't mean that they are correct. They just um, dumped them so, out. Right? They didn't They didn't vet them. They didn't give them to a journalistic entity. They claimed we're a journalistic entity, but they just dumped them. Right. Which to me, I guess, is why I've always viewed Snowden and Assange differently yes. and be, because of exactly what you said i've always viewed them in, in in different ways and and in my 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 thoughts on chelsea manning although i think that the way that she was treated while she was incarcerated and a lot of those things have been terrible you know um because she was you know a soldier when she leaked that information you know um there was some you know certain things that for me made that a little bit uh, more, uh, I guess, complicated too. But I think that that gets to the key point of this, right, is that, you know, what he what he's now being kind of uh, accused of um, are, are things that are, you know, I guess, fundamentally comes to the question of whether or not what he does is journalism. And um, although I see is he making that argument? Is he saying I'm a journalist, I'm doing journalism? I don't think he, he has is. said that. He, he's not saying that right now. He has said that in the past. WikiLeaks has absolutely said that in the past. But WikiLeaks has changed so much in the last decade that it's it's hard to know where where they stand, right? And and I think it's interesting that a lot of the First Amendment, amendment um, you know, um, advocates and, and experts have very clearly tried to narrow this and say this is not about, you know, uh, this is not going under journalistic things. And again, this is about hacking, uh, which whether you're a journalist or not is, is is you know, you're, you're not immune to those sorts of things if you're breaking into to um, other people's, um, uh, you know, databases and whatnot. So, but but it, I, it still, this question does come up, right? Like, is what what was the role in this, and how is this different? Um, I'm, I'm with you, Leo. It, it, I, it's complicated. Um, it's troubling it, to me. It, it it is troubling in a lot of ways. It's interesting to think about what would have happened if he would have just not been such a jerk such a dick. at the embassy. <laughs> but that's, you know? like he, okay. Uh, like, like, honestly, yeah, like, like yeah. it, because it got to the point that it was, it was, it was Ecuador finally had enough and they're like, we're not dealing with you anymore. Um, but th this is a, 
this is a clear example of um, short-term gain without thinking about the downstream implications. And I think that uh, in all of my, from what I've read, uh, you know, it seems as though some of the people involved uh, had their hearts in the right places. But again, like you've got to think in a very rational, measured way. What are all of the implications of making this information public at this particular time in this particular way? Um, well, you know, I and think that's, we that's can agree the, that he sh it should have been done, at least should have been done in Snowden fashion. Something more yeah, well, responsibly, now, right? Right. There are... But he's not a, he's not a U.S. citizen. Right. Um, so I mean, right. This, this is the other thing. Like, I know a lot about the First Amendment because I had to study it, you know. Um, you, people, a lot of Americans don't quite understand the First Amendment and people outside the United States aren't bound by it. Right. Um, so, again, I think this is but where. But he's not being, he's being prosecuted by the U.S., not by people outside of the United yeah, States. Yeah, but it's not, the First Amendment is not a piece of this. This is under a, uh, well, just well, standard cyber crimes to, law. To reiterate. Mm -hmm. Your point, uh, this is from the Ball article, the Obama administration had an institutional policy that concluded prosecuting Assange for the publication of classified documents was too controversial and legally risky because a successful prosecution could serve as the foundation for future misuse of that authority to clamp down on more traditional media outlets. The risk to the First Amendment was significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he points out perhaps... The Trump administration has discovered additional evidence that changes that analysis. And that's what we don't know yet. Um, and, but, but you have, but I mean, have, the optics of it are, if you're going to prosecute him for the email that says, well, our team is working on it. Well, we're going to help you crack this, Chelsea. If you're going to prosecute him on that, it's clear that what you're really, pro you're prosecuting him for the, for the release of the information. You just, you just don't want to call right. it that. It's like putting Al Capone in jail for tax evasion. That's, you know, it wasn't the real reason he was in Alcatraz, but it was a good, it was an effective surrogate. Well, and also let's not forget that you never want to, no lawyers or governments want to bring somebody to trial or bring charges if they're not very, very certain right. that they're going to win. Right. Um, so. And, and, you know, Assange complicated it by, by uh, his personality disorder. It, what, I guess I could call it a personality. Something went on that... <laughs> caused him to uh i think if you're confined for seven that years could be the I mean, reason I, you know yeah i'm confined one of the reasons the ecuadorian embassy kicked busy. him out is he wasn't cleaning up after his cat that's well, one of the reasons been, they gave yeah well there's well, other cleaning issues he was playing playing music loud at night he was stinky and he wasn't there cleaning was, up after his cat there was a great, uh, there was a great article uh, uh, um, a few months ago about somebody who, I guess, like he was their house guest and he wouldn't leave. Who yes. described what it was like? Yes. This was years before, you know, um, uh, he was he he went into the Ecuadorian embassy. And apparently, he's like the house guest from hell, no matter where he is and no matter what his circumstances. So, you know, but, that's, you, but you shouldn't that's put somebody that. in jail for that. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, you but at the same time, them. I. I I, I, I'm with you, but I also That's sort tough. of sympathize in some ways with the Ecuadorian. Oh, I don't blame like, the Ecuadorians. In fact, I'm, I'm you're, impressed. You're like, we, we didn't sign up for this. For you know, nine like, years, I, they put up with that. It's pretty good. But uh, like, the, the sad like, thing is, like, the sad thing is that this is a good opportunity for us to talk about how to move forward and what needs to change going forward and how to, you know, and, and that's not happening. Uh, we're, you know, like nobody's taking this as an opportunity to recalibrate well, how we deal with, you know, our laws and technology and crime and all that stuff. Your point being that things have changed thanks to technology and we need to update our thinking about what that means, what the First Amendment means in that light. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like this we cycle every couple of years. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf and there's a, a Wired reporter named Andy Greenberg who wrote this really yeah. great book yeah. called This Machine Steals Secrets. Yep. Um, like every couple of years, there's this conversation that... Um, that sort of pipes up and we all get fascinated about it and then we forget about it and we move on and then we're surprised when it all happens again or we're stuck in a similar situation where we don't know what to do and now, you know, um, I just, I feel like we keep missing these opportunities to make some changes, you know. Uh, and let's not forget, speaking of forgetting, one more person I don't want to forget who's reality winner uh, who uh, is in jail five years for leaking the hacking report that told us that Russia was hacking the elections. And um, 
That I one's a stranger case to me. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 one I feel bad for her in some ways. A you know, she she tried to pass this off the right way. The the intercept really messed yeah. up there. You know, like honestly, you look at that and you're like, if, if you're going to be accepting, if you're going to be, in my opinion, if you're saying send us secure things and we're gonna protect you, then you need to take that of utmost importance. And and, and that they really dropped the ball there in that she, one. Like uh, that, that's yeah. she's uh, yeah. under the longest sentence ever imposed in federal court for an unauthorized release of government information to the media. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, this is more than a slap. Well, but so, so this is interesting, right? So right after WikiLeaks, um, a handful of news organizations got together, including The Guardian, and created a secure leaking secure area of their website. Right. right. Um, secure so, yep. right. So, and that had been in use and the standard, I mean, she, reality winner, as far as I understand, followed the, the, the appropriate steps to try to, yep port internally and then leak in a, in a way that she would have been covered under whistleblower. I thought, um, this is by the way, why so, Snowden did what he did. He, he, he felt that he would go to jail if he tried that route. Yeah. They proved Snowden right. In effect. Yeah, no, but, but I mean, and I don't know where the breakdown was of the intercept with that process. I know that when, because, uh, uh, Gizmodo media group had secure drop and I know that to even get access, like, I had to do an, like an all day training thing um, to even be able to use it. And, and there were very specific things and, and our lawyers were involved and there was a whole, you know, but there was a whole process. Um, so I don't know where the breakdown was with, with when they published things or, or whatnot, like what was visible and what wasn't, but it was something that clearly, you know, was not done correctly. I feel like they, but, what, what, she, she snuck printouts out and I think that they published yep. those unchanged and they were able to, because of the secret, uh, dots on printouts, they were able to trace trace it back to her because they they published photos right. of the printouts rather than the content itself by itself, something like that. So uh, I'm super curious. The training that you had what, to to look at content that had been leaked, you know, what what was the training? Like, what did they teach? What what did you learn? Well, I mean, it was it was about how to use the system, how to access things. Um, and then there were things about, yeah, I mean, in terms of like when when viewing, you know, data, how how to handle it. Um, you know, uh, this was was there like a prescriptive, like aside from the technical, like how to get the content? Did was there like a codified um, in this like a decision tree in this case, tell our legal department in this case, you can report yeah. on the story? Yeah, I, I mean that that was definitely part of it, and 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 it wasn't like maybe codified in that way, but it was definitely one of those things, and it was definitely, I mean, for for us, it was if like when in doubt, you know, talk to the lawyers um, who were were fortunately downstairs, you know, to, to to get to get clearance, and definitely, you know, talk to the lawyers before uploading any sort of documents you get from SecureDrop to Document Cloud or whatever. Although um, Gizmodo okay, is so probably more the point. more concerned about Apple than uh, the U.S. government, right? I mean, it was. Uh, not necessarily. Really? You not necessarily. Did you expect leaks from uh, the NSA? I mean, at this point, some of the best reporters who you have there are, are Del Cameron and, and right. Uh, right. It, you know, I mean, so not necessarily. I mean, you never know when you're going to be getting That's things. True. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just Gizmodo, you know, it was also the investigations team and it was, you know, lots of other parts of uh, uh, other sites. But no, I mean, you would be surprised. I'm showing, you know what, I'm showing my uh, my age and my bias because I still think of gadget blogs versus real journalism. And that's completely no, right. blurred. I mean, but, I see a headline in BuzzFeed. I think, is this six ways to cook a steak or is this going to be, uh, you know, an expose? Right. And, uh, and often I'm wrong. So, yeah. I mean, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that because we were, um, you know, a, a media entity that was known to publish things, right. uh, people would leak things regardless. Uh, you know, people knew that they could come to us because it would get published, which is not always the case. So there were things that we would get that others wouldn't or that we might be hungrier for because we would publish those things. And that's still the case with that organization now across all of its different properties is that they'll publish things and that not everyone else will. So you would be surprised the sort of stuff that would come in. Um, and, and especially around, you know, any of the election stuff, especially around cybercrime stuff. Yeah, sure. you know, there sure. was, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that sort of stuff. Yeah, and it's, there's a big overlap these days between uh, cybercrime and political crime. So absolutely. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, lots more to talk about. Google's in a little bit of trouble. I'm a little worried about Apple and Amazon's moving to Bellevue. Are you going to, you're going <laughs> to, 
I don't know if they that's... just built the spheres. I know Even. they just know. they just built them. What they is... are gorgeous. I mean, you, you like the spheres? I love the spheres. Love to visit them. Seventy-three degrees all year tonight. round. Yeah, like Hawaii in Seattle. And it's beautiful. There's like forty thousand species of of plant life. It's perfect humidity. It smells good. It's like I want to move in there. You could work in there. I know. I, I I live I live just uh, about you know um, a, a quarter of a mile away from them, um, which is why I don't mind them moving to Bellevue because maybe Seattle uh, uh, West Side home prices will go down. Maybe maybe. I want to write Probably. a dystopian science fiction novel in which Seattle has moved out of the spheres and they've been taken over by <laughs> gangs, <laughs> and there and they, I don't know. There's, I, there's something there. There's something there. The future. Let's take a break. Our show today brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Hello, Zip Recruiter. Good to see you. We love Zip. We're big fans of Zip Recruiter. Hiring is such an important part of building a company. The company, what a company, what is a company? A company is made of people with an aligned goal, working together, getting the right people can take your company to the moon and stars. Getting the wrong people can take you down. And that's why hiring is the most important thing you do in your company. It's also the, sometimes the most challenging. And what's really hard if you're a small company like ours or, you know, you just have a few employees is you're doing all this when you're down a person. You're already in the penalty box and now you got to win the game. That's why you need ZipRecruiter on your team. ZipRecruiter is the smart way to hire. First of all, we've already mentioned this. When you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit and post your job, you're sending it to over 100 of the world's top job boards. So you're you're spreading your net wide. Your message goes out. You're more likely to reach that perfect person. You just don't know. You know they're out there. You just don't know where they are. So you're more likely to get to that person. But there's more than that. And this is what's so cool. They don't use the word AI. But I, I almost want to use this word AI because... They use matching technology. See, they already have millions of resumes because lots of people come to ZipRecruiter. It's a job site. So they scan those resumes to find people with the right experience for your job. And then they say, you might want to apply to this job. I, and I've seen this work because when our, uh, our bookkeeper, a couple, about six months ago, gave us two weeks notice, Lisa went, oh, no, I have to do the books. I don't want to do it. I'm not to hire. So I, we had, this was at breakfast. I said, ZipRecruiter. She posted it before lunch. We had three. They, they came in, like, kept coming in. Oh, this is, this is good. Oh, this person's great. We had three before lunch great candidates. That's that artif artificial intelligence. That's that matching technology. As the uh, applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one, spotlights the top candidates, so you never miss a great match. And by the way, they don't flood your inbox. They don't call you. It all goes into the ZipRecruiter interface. All the resumes are formatted so they look the same. It's easy. You can even have screening questions, essay questions, true, false, multiple choice. So you can eliminate people who just don't fit. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. We got one within the first hour. I, it blew my mind. Right now, this week in tech, listeners can try ZipRecruiter free at our exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. We thank them so much for uh, a service that we have used and loved. So I got I got a little nervous when I, uh, when I read this in the Apple developer documentation. Microsoft's moving this way, too. I'm actually curious, Christina, what you think of this. I think every operating system looks at uh, mobile operating systems, especially iOS, and says, you know, iOS is more secure because Apple requires developers to, to have, you know, a, uh, a, a signature and they vet the apps. Microsoft released Windows S, same idea. You got to get it mm -hmm. through the store. Um, I know that uh, Apple has Gatekeeper on Mac OS. And now the latest thing, which scared some people, and, and maybe it depends how you read this, Mike, Apple says before 10.14.5, uh, the next version of Mac OS, uh, if you want to distribute software on Mac OS, your software has to be notarized in order to run. In a future version of macOS, notarization will be required by default for all software. That really confuses me. 
I, I heard about this and I read through it because I've got a couple of scripts that I wrote that are going to be broken. Right. But I, I don't understand. So like, code signing they, makes you sense already had to for security. But right now, if you download an app on Mac OS and it's not signed, but right, you, right. you have to like bypass it's, it's more like Android, you, 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 where Android, you could check you a box. Right -click. Yeah, you have to right click, right -click and, and say, I, I agree to install this yeah. anyway. Yes. Right. So and, and it strikes this, this me that like this is a way to, to lock out anybody who has not gotten the additional layer of... Which is not but, but free, already, by the way. You have to have a developer ID. You have to, you know, there's so a lot of... The extra, like, what is this? All, I mean, why make the change, I guess, is the thing that I don't quite understand. Well, there's not really... There's also issues if you're, like, you have your own scripts. If you're doing development at home and you write a program for yourself, can you run it? So there have been... I've seen a lot of commentary on this. And the question is, what does Apple mean? Apple has yet to explain that when mm -hmm. they say notarization will be required by default for all software, does that mean that the end... It must mean that the end user... That that's the default, but the end user can override it. It must mean. Otherwise... Yeah. You couldn't write your own programs. Yeah, I believe that's what I mean. That's how I'm reading it. Is that is that it's going to be by default the same way that Gatekeeper is by default. It's going to say that apps have to be notarized. And I assume that the reason they're doing this is that what has happened a number of times is that there will be software that is signed by a developer uh, certificate, and then is um, something happens to it is it, it, it's you know bypassed in some way, and so they want to have that one extra level. Of protection to ensure that that's happening. Um, if you're writing your own scripts and whatnot, and if you do have, you know, um, a, a, a developer ID, um, there is a way that you can kind of build this into your workflow and 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 have the notarization process part of it. And like, I pay for a developer account in part just to do stuff like that, and also because I like to get the early access yeah. builds to things. It's ninety nine um, bucks. It's not prohibitively it's not, expensive. No, but it's also not one of those things that every single person who creates a few custom Apple script things should have to do, you know, if they don't want to get um, uh, alerted all the time. Like it, 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 there, there's a, 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 there's kind of a ridiculous process there. Um, it would be nice if they had a way to get notarized without having to be part of the developer program. You know, like if, if, if it was something that would be free, that was separate, it's like, okay, if you want to distribute in the app store, you have to pay. But if you're not distributed in the app store, We'll still give you a developer account. We can notarize your stuff, but you can self-notarize. You know, okay. uh, yeah, you can, but you just, have to have a developer ID and a right. certificate. Right, I don't think that's just like a a name, like a new name for an existing work stream. That like I, I, essentially, I, my understanding, the point of this would be that we know who made every app running on your system. You know who? Do they not and, currently know that? No, of course not. I can I can give you an app. I can send you an app. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, Somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Okay, okay. So now you have to have, you have to be verified by Apple. This is you. This is your real address. And as you point out, Christina, this has not worked perfectly. There were Turkish certificates that were uh, used by malware. They were legitimate yeah, certificates. Yeah. Yeah. There have been a lot of those. And there's also been the sort of thing what's happened is that people oftentimes for, for pirated stuff, because we were seeing this on iOS as well, where people would create, they would use the enterprise certificates and That's use right. that as a way including Facebook apps. and Google. <laughs> exactly, precisely, right? And but, but what they were doing was actually something that a lot of, you know, companies have used for years to kind of get away with some of the app store restrictions because for the enterprise things, you can bypass a lot of that stuff. So they're like, oh, we want to access pirated content. We can do that using this app that is that has been done by a developer uh, certificate. And um, I guess because they have so many of those, those aren't vetted in the same way. And right. like you said, the Turkish malware instance, that's been the sort of situation. So I think that they're trying to, you know, stop that as a vector of spreading malware and spreading other things because people do use their, their you know, developer certificates to distribute stuff. And, and there might not be that, you know, um, same level of, of scrutiny that, that, we, that you think that there might be. So, but you're not wrong in the, in the fact that, it's going to be an edge case, but it's going to be the edge cases where this is one of those instances, at least in my opinion, where the people who are impacted the most by this are some of the power users and the people who are really dedicated to being on Mac OS. Well, uh, and which people who use Microsoft's Visual Studio uh, on Mac because it says you have to use Xcode 10 or later. Um, the only reason any nor if, if Microsoft said this, everybody go, yeah, you know, no, that's you know, there's always going to be a way, but people. Maybe it's just me, 
But I'm paranoid about Apple. I The day they started the App Store and Gatekeeper, I thought it's only a matter of time before they make sure that everything goes through the App Store. This is their new model. Mm -hmm. We collect 30% of all revenue right. for the privilege and, and of data. letting you run something on Mac OS. It, there is an advantage that, they, you know, a case you can make to consumers. Well, it makes you safer. Um, I guess if I... It would be really problematic to do it on a desktop operating system, though. Yeah. So what happens I, then if you're... So, so, like, I have a couple of, like... There's a couple of different ways of distributing prototype software, and I'm just... Now I'm trying to figure out how does that even... Well, on work, iOS, they have, that, track, they have a way of doing it. They have a test hockey, flight application. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. There's test flight. Um, and, and that's when you use that enterprise certificate. Right, uh, but what part then is notarized is the... Do you have to know? Do you have to like go through this entire process? Yes. The initial builds? you can't. I can't just send you something to run on iOS. Right, but but I think that what it'll yeah. happen is that it's to be part of that build workflow. So once you build it in Xcode, it's going to be the same way it would be signed now. The way that you would have to still sign some sort of you know prototype thing to, to go through you know hockey or test flight or whatever. It, it, the notarization process is going to be part of that workflow. And I don't know definitively. I'll have to check for Provisional Studio for Mac, but I assume that because there is like a CLI and there are different ways that you can um, incorporate Xcode stuff into other IDEs like Visual Studio um, uh, for, for Mac that they will just, you know, use that. That would sort make of sense, thing. right? You just you use that part of Xcode to Exactly. Sign. And yeah. so, so, and I, so I assume it's going to be a pain when you get set up, but I think that the idea will be once you have it done and once it's in your kind of, you know, keychain of, of things that you're doing with your tooling, Theoretically, it shouldn't be that. Uh, I hope so. There shouldn't be any I'm difference. I'm sure I'm yeah, overstating I'm this. I just, uh, you could see why people went, whoa. <laughs> well, without a doubt, they haven't done a great job of explaining what this is. Yeah. And it's also, you know, when, when they say by default, that that implies, again, like with Gatekeeper, that there's still going to be a way to install other things. And I'm with you. I think that if your main operating system, like even, you know, S mode is a mode, you know, if you need to install things outside of the store or things that, that can't be done from the store, you can turn that off. I um, think that, you know, I don't know how many people, I know I wouldn't be willing to accept an operating system. It's one of the reasons I don't use Chrome OS that only lets you run certain types of applications. That's just, you know, where this you know, comes from. I, it, on iPad, I won't put up with it on a, on a laptop. I just get, I'm nervous because I feel like yeah, this so-called post PC era, we're, we're heading, hurtling down this track where everything will be like iOS or Chrome OS. And certainly consumers, in many respects, should be using Chrome OS and iOS. I tell people all the time, uh, okay. that's, a, that's a safer alternative if your needs are simple. But uh, as, a, as a driver of a truck, in effect, uh, I, wanna, I wanna be able to, to, to do my own thing and I want others to be able to. I want open source software to exist. I, there's just a lot of reasons why some, some operating systems need to be open. I mean, I guess yeah. Linux will always be open, right? Well, there's also interoperability, right? So, I mean, I guess we kind of been talking about that, but this this creates another fissure and more balkanization, which yes. we, which is not That's good right. because right. this isn't just about an, a singular OS. It ties into cloud services, right? So, it, and mm -hmm. cloud services have AI now as a service on the cloud, and it's, you know. There's a longer tail here. Is it something that we need to do to protect users? Is is it the the security? environment yeah. has become so hostile yeah yeah yes. i mean how many i mean yeah nobody takes nobody up to if they weren't forced to people wouldn't wouldn't go through on firmware updates they don't change their passwords mm -hmm. they're using legacy code they're downloading what they think are games to their devices so it's your brother-in-law's fault it's not our fault it's your brother-in-law's fault tell him to knock it off I should do that. My, yeah, I mean, <laughs> knock it off. I'm, my, uh, my dad has been the victim of ransomware twice. Although, so has Norsk Hydro, the second biggest aluminum producer in the world. Merck, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. It's not like it's restricted to family There's another members. way to think about this. There's another way to think about this, which is if it's the case that people are very concerned about data and privacy and it's an election year and Apple's already fairly far ahead with differential privacy and other kinds of measures, right? Then it kind of, to me, looks like a way to generate strategic advantage and leverage over everybody else. Um, if their products are beloved and they've locked them down such that like nobody else can get inside and they're the yeah. literally gatekeepers of all that data. 
Yeah. Under the guise of, of privacy. And, and that's the funny thing. Right yeah. The yeah. Regulations that we'll are being We'll protect proposed. you. You're safe in yeah. our walled garden. That's right. That's right. exactly right. And that would that would be probably music to the ears of a lot of legislators who are proposing all kinds of crazy privacy measures right now. Well, speaking of privacy, New York Times with not one but two articles about a Google technology that's being used by law enforcement. See, Google knows where you are at all times. And uh, apparently, um, Google is happy to share that information with law enforcement. The thing that we I'd heard about this um, being proposed in the past uh, that I think was in Upper New York State, a, uh, a police department asked Google, well, we'd like to know everybody who is in the vicinity of these convenience store robberies at these times. And Google fought it. And I thought at the time that was kind of refused by the yeah. courts as a fishing expedition, except that now, according to the New York Times, this happens all the time where... <sighs> Google will be asked to provide information. In this case, uh, they started with a, a murder in a Phoenix suburb. Uh, a search warrant required Google to provide information on all the devices, all the devices near the killing, potentially capturing the whereabouts of anyone in the area. You know, this isn't just Google. Uh, Amazon has also uh, the external cameras and, and Google's external house cameras um, yeah, the know, but there are a lot of yeah. communities where police are asking the neighbors to let them connect any, there's a community in Dallas where the, I'm sorry, Houston, where the police have asked, um, neighbors to let them take over their cameras and look at footage whenever, well, in a, but, you know, in but, I mean, I, I've seen enough <laughs> police procedurals on TV to know that the first thing you do is you go to the convenience store across the street and you ask to see the videos because they have mm -hmm. a camera pointing at the crime scene. That doesn't bother me. As Why does much this bother you? Because everybody who was in that vicinity is drawn up in this law enforcement net. And in fact, uh, the case that the New York Times talks about, a suspect was arrested because due to this data, because his iPhone, his phone said uh, he was uh, on the scene. And it turned out after he spent a week in jail, it wasn't him. It was his mother's ex-boyfriend who borrowed his car. And so this guy, because of this, and see, this is, to me, the classic fishing expedition where police, I know police would love to say, well, we'd like to know everybody who was in the, in the area. I thought that was illegal, but maybe, but maybe I'm right. Isn't yeah. that unconstitutional? No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a fan of this either. The first thing I thought about when I saw this, I was like, okay, well, now I want to purge all of my Google history, you know, um, on my phone and whatnot. Or I mean, well, and, that and was I, the, and uh, by the way, the, uh, on Hacker News, that was the uh, immediate response of everybody on Hacker News was, well, here's how you stop that by turning off all your Google location information. And, but, but of course, what's frustrating about that is that it's 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 helpful to have. Yeah, then your maps don't work. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. And it's not like I even like I'm not anticipating being in a situation where this will matter or well, I'll, I'll, I will be implicated in something. But it's not about that. I, I don't like the idea, as you say, of like it's one thing if the camera is is ca that data is captured, you know, from the convenience store. Or whatever. I know I'm in a public place. I know my image might be there, and if they can identify me and ask me questions, that's fine. Maybe but, that's what's yeah, different because like, you, you're in a public area, but but that GPS information, and I know some courts have ruled this, is a more personal thing. Right. And also we've seen before where, you know, it can be far beyond just that vicinity. You know, they might be asking, oh, we just want this radius, but if they go a little bit further, you know, I mean, I just, I, I'm it makes me uneasy. I'm not a fan. And I don't like that it seems like this has become commonplace. And to your point that Google is, because I remember the first time that this came up, they're like, oh no, we're going to fight right. this. And I, as I naively assumed, oh, well, they're going to continue to fight this. And now it's like, eh, no, we'll just hand it over. It's like, really? Really? Can, so you, again, can you just like, not? There are fixes here. So that the, o, the easy OS fix is just like build it into the OS on your devices and put an off, like toggle on off button in a visible Easy to understand. Yeah, but remember like, like, Google getting in trouble because it turns out when you did turn it off, it didn't it actually turn it off. <laughs> well, some of the other apps wouldn't work. I don't know. Again, like we, but this is not the first time we've had this conversation. We had this no. conversation after the San Bernardino shootings. Yeah. What was it now? Three years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I, so 
we're we're going to keep cycling back to this. And what I would say is, you know, the New York Times is a very large publication, but most of America doesn't read it. So like we're having this conversation, you know, most people aren't reading that story and have absolutely no idea how their data are being collected. Um, Google and there's actually no to- has a brand name for it. They call it Sensor Vault. And according to the New York Times, Google's sensor vault is a boon for law enforcement. This is how it works. There's a database. Uh, it's connected to a Google service called Location History. Everybody should go to google.com slash dashboard and look at your location use history. You'll see how granular it is. Um, by the way, according to the Times, location history is not on by default. But as soon as you turn on your phone and you start to use a Google service like Maps, it'll say, can I turn on location history or photos? Can I turn on location? You you know, and most people say, yes. Google says, we use this to target ads and to measure how effective they are. So, by the way, that means they're watching you go into stores uh, and then they watch the credit card transaction and they know the credit card was yours and they even offer this information to people who buy Google ads. It's not just a click. We can also tell you if the person ended up buying your product using their credit card because we're watching where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so, And that's actually old technology. That, oh, yeah. That launched a couple of years yep. ago where they, yeah. But the thing that's to me a little scary is, and I, you know, I don't blame law enforcement. It's a tool. And if, as long as Google's willing to give this to you, why not? Sure. These are called so-called geofence requests. So they say mm -hmm. instead of, and see, this is what I thought was unconstitutional. Instead of saying, where was Leo on the night of Friday, July, July 17th? They say, well, who was in that area on the night of July 17th? Let's see them all and we'll talk to each one of them or we'll investigate some other way each one of them. Google labels the devices with anonymous ID numbers. Detectives look at locations and movement patterns. This is according to the New York Times to see if any appear relevant to the crime. Once they narrow the field to a few devices, Google then <laughs> presto pulls off the <laughs> the the, uh, the the hider and uh, reveals the information like names and email addresses. So um, anyway, it's guess something people should be aware of. I guess um, you're right. Very few people will be, except people who read the New York Times or listen to this show. But uh, I I'm surprised this is. So that again, that begs the question. <laughs> This is where we keep, where we get stuck. You know, we buy the technology, and so we feel like we own it. And oh, there's a feeling mistake. like we own it. I think makes people believe that they have some agency in what's being done. And in fact, right. we don't own any of the technology. We own the ability to use it for some amount of time, yeah. but we don't own it outright. Like when you buy a water bottle, you get to determine. You know all the things that happen with that water bottle on your own. This is this not, and I think we've done a piss poor job of making sure that everyday people understand this. And uh, you know, as your, your to your point that you know this is something that probably uh, governments should look into and regulations about it. But Illinois attempted this um, mm -hmm. April tenth. The Illinois State Senate passed something called the Keep Internet Devices Safe Act. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it did pass, but after fierce lobbying from uh, an industry association backed by Amazon and Google, they defanged it a little bit by uh, taking away any punishment. Um, but the idea was that no private entity could turn on or enable a device's microphone unless you agreed. And uh, the bill requires any recordings or other personal information captured by devices protect against, quote, unauthorized access, acquisition, destruction, use, modification, and disclosure of the data. Initially, the bill would have made this uh, an unlawful practice under the Consumer Fraud and Deceptive Business Practices Act, which could result in fines of up to $50,000 per case. Uh, but lobbying by the Internet Association defanged it by saying, well, uh, we don't have to have a punishment. <laughs> It just, it just ultimately, <laughs> Illinois, Illinois has actually been pretty far ahead in fighting big tech. Um, is, it really? Was, this is interesting. A, uh, yeah. Huh. But here's the thing. The laws and the regulation only matters if they're if they are enforced. Right. And also if they deter people from using things that the regulators think are bad for them. I mean, the problem is that people keep buying and using the stuff knowing mm -hmm. that, that that there may be negative outcomes. So like 
But I'm going to give you yeah. um, the the my reaction to this, which is kind of the opposite, which is, oh, great. Now all these privacy n n nervous Nellies are going to make it illegal for my Amazon Echo to work. Oh, right. gotcha. And yeah, I well, want my Echo. Well, that's again, the thing, right? That's always the convenience that's, store. I want it to listen to me. The the convenience store. So so if somebody was robbed in a convenience store in the eighties, the police are still going to show up and they're going to ask a bunch of people who were there, and then they're going to round up the usual suspects in probably a very very racist way, right? Um, I, I would argue that that's not the the only difference between the nineteen eighties and the twenty eight late twenty tens is that. Um, it requires less humans and more of that process is automated. But it's, it strikes me that it's sort of like the same process still. Yeah. No? I don't know. You're right. I mean, now we have racist uh, face recognition. So that's simple. Right, but it's that's, like the that same, speeds up the <laughs> process. It, it speeds up. Right. So it like speeds up what we were kind of already doing. I'm not saying that's good or bad. No, I'm it's just, it's look, it's just another different. tool for law enforcement. Uh, and and you you said it. There's there's got to be checks and balances. Law enforcement, I understand, and we want them to fight crime and arrest bad guys, and we want them to do it in a constitutionally protect manner that protects us against overreaching state uh, authorities. So we want both, and and uh, and we need both. I think uh, I'm not against law enforcement using the technology. I just think it needs to be done. Uh, conforming with the, the Constitution uh, and, the, and particularly the rules against uh, unlawful search and seizure and, um, you know, testifying against yourself, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Who had that story recently about the people who do QA on, I think it was Amazon devices and like they what they've been listening to as part of that QA process? Oh, like, yeah. You know. That just came out this week, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amazon mm -hmm. said, well, and but you know what? This is not a surprise to anybody who understands how AI works. Uh, right. That this is called training. Yeah. So uh, Amazon says humans uh, are going to transcribe to in improve the customer experience some of your recordings. This comes from a, a Bloomberg uh, story, so we'll give Bloomberg the credit. Amazon workers are listening to what you tell Echo. Uh, global not team. Everybody. No, it's no, not everybody. They're no, doing it sampling. In small batches, but yeah, right. they can't. <laughs> right. They can't. And I think some of them were in Romania and some of them, but but you know, it sounded like they had question. Like some people thought they heard overheard domestic violence. You know, other ones heard really. So they were PTSD. They had PTSD. Amazon Employ, according to Bloomberg, employs thousands of people around the world to help improve Amazon's digital assistant. The team listens to voice recordings captured in Echo owners' homes and offices. The recordings are transcribed, annotated, and fed back into the software. To This is to make it better, right? To eliminate gaps in Echo's understanding of human speech. And actually, Amazon's asked us to do that too, right? If you can actually go back and look at all the things you said, you can hear what you said, and you can tell Echo if you got it right. Uh, the voice review process... And Bloomberg had seven people, anonymous sources. Um, it's not a surprise. Mix of contractors, full-time Amazon employees who work at, from Boston to Costa Rica to India to Romania. They can't speak publicly about the program because they sign non-disclosure agreements. They work nine hours a day. What a nightmare job. Parsing mm -hmm. as many as a thousand audio clips per shift. According to two workers, it in sounds the, just. Workers. I mean, it sounds as about as about a bad as bad as working as a Facebook stacker in the in the Amazon or that warehouse. Too. Yeah, yeah. Look, it uh, it's clear that technology has created a lot of inhuman jobs, but at least there's jobs that humans can do. Uh, um, one that's like one, one of the saddest things I've ever heard. <laughs> that really hey, got me. At least we got a job, man. You know, it's so depressing, but you're right. <laughs> but it's true. Until we train them uh, well enough, and then we'll, we'll be out of work. Yeah. It's like Uber drivers, basically. You're yeah. just a stand-in for the artificial intelligence until we get that good enough. Yeah. The worker, yeah. the work is mostly mundane. One worker in Boston said he mined accumulated voice data. You'll like this uh, film, girl, for specific utterances such as Taylor Swift. Apparently, they were listening. <laughs> they were listening to your echo, and they annotated them to, to indicate echo. the searcher meant the musical artist. As opposed to, I don't know, Taylor Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels. What I don't know. Right. What other? <laughs> Occasionally, now 
On the other hand, well, I, I won't say that. Occasionally, the listeners picked up things Echo owners likely would rather stay private. A woman singing badly off-key in the shower. Well, who doesn't do that? Or a child screaming for help. Ooh, that would be hard. The teams use internal chat rooms to share files when they need help parsing a muddled word or come across an amusing recording. <sighs> so... Amazon's response, we take the security and privacy of our customers' personal information seriously. We only annotate an extremely small sample of uh, echo voice recordings. I'm sorry, I said the A word. In order to improve the customer experience, for example, this information helps us train our speech recognition and natural language understanding systems. This was exactly the same thing that we were uh, learning about. Um, uh, who, who was that uh, that was doing that? Nest? I can't remember. Oh, with the uh, microphone? Yeah. 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 Th this is just what, this is This is how, pe I think people, technology it's is a, always it's, assumed it's to be. It's do it in first in like, and apologize later. Well, but also, it's also assumed there's no human intervention. It's in the shiny box. and But there's, but somebody's got to train this stuff. We use multi-factor authentication to restrict access, service encryption, and audits of our control environment to protect it. And by the way, this article does not imply that there were leaks of any of this information. It's just a, a revelation that it happens. But if you'd asked me before this, I would have, and I thought about it, I would have said, well, yeah, I, I'm sure they're doing that. And so what happens if somebody d decides to, to do an audio file dump on the WikiLeaks using all of this or whatever? I mean, they this can is have like, me singing off key. In the, in the no, show. but like, yeah. and, and, you know, supposedly it's anonymized and there's, but but you can still associate the account number according to the, story well, this the account number with this the this validates all the people say i will never have an amazon echo or google home or any of these things in my house guess they will <laughs> yeah i was gonna say i mean like so there are some people who won't but once you've had the ability to to say hey you know keyword play whatever or read me the weather or you know what's on my calendar it's kind of awesome like you know i mean like as creepy as all of this stuff has the potential to be there's this other side of it that is really compelling well, and I, but it's also yeah you know yeah but it's also like really hard to buy a device that doesn't have a camera or a speaker in it uh, like your, your true, televisions have a camera the remote controls you get from your cable services have a mm -hmm. microphone built in and some of them you just yeah. talk to and some yeah. of them you have to why do you think certain. that is is that because everybody's demanding the ability to ask to watch game of no, thrones because they no, because they want the information to sell to other people. The cable companies you. want to be able to do that. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that with the TV capture stuff, they don't even need to have the camera and the TV thing. Like, it'll literally capture what pixels are on the screen yeah. and then send them out to say, oh, this is what you were watching. I mean, that was what happened with the Vizio and the Samsung cases. <laughs> it's not even about a camera. It's literally taking a sampling of the pixels that are on the screen. And if you, I've tried to do this. I tried to do this recently to try to find like a, a non-smart television set because I was just looking for like a dumb I want TV a monitor. Thing. I'm with you. I just want yeah, a monitor. I'll add the intelligence. You can't do it. Nope. Can't and you it. can't do it. Like it's it's not possible unless you're getting something that's years old out of warranty and you know all kinds of other things. Like they literally don't exist. Even at the very high end where you used to be able to go and if you spent like X thousands of dollars, you know, it wouldn't have it. Even those, it's like no, it's gonna have this stuff in it. You know my uh how my my rule of thumb for knowing if this is problematic is if my reaction is, well, I have nothing to hide. Uh, I'm not doing anything wrong. So if Google knows where I am, big deal. I'm not saying anything bad. So if Amazon's listening to me, big deal. And I know as soon as I say that to myself, which I have, that's, we got a problem. There's a big problem. Nobody should yep. ever have to say, well, I've got nothing to hide. No, never. Did I ever tell you about the, the origin of the word privacy in Japanese? It sounds no. like a non sequitur, but it, it sequits. Um, um, so I lived in Japan the first time in the, in the nineties. And, uh, this was right on the cusp of the internet, um, and being able an e-commerce and being able to share internet, uh, data and buy stuff. And I, I remember in Japan, uh, that I couldn't just order stuff online yet because, uh, it was a very private country and people thought it was crazy that you would just type in a credit oh, card number. Wow. Um, that like, that was insane. This bastion of all this super high tech, um, you know, was a place where internet, um, e-commerce hadn't 
hadn't quite landed yet. And when it finally did, they had to invent a word to talk about privacy because wow. privacy was eroding and they had never had to discuss it before because it was just assumed that um, that you had it. And the Japanese word for privacy is puraibashi. <laughs> they hmm. borrowed it. Wow. Uh, Isn't English, that funny but, that it's not because they didn't know about privacy. It's because it was just, you didn't need a word for it. It just is. Right. So to what you were just saying, which is I don't have anything to hide. I don't like the fact that I have to have that conversation. Yeah. We didn't used to have to have that conversation. And now here we are where either we just assume that we hope that we don't have anything to hide and yet we have no control over it anyway. So this is just the way we're appeasing ourselves, I guess. Um, or we try to rail against it or we just close our eyes and and forget that it's that that everybody else is looking in. I mean, this is a good I don't know. a good panel for these this topic because I think all th well I I'll leave myself out. Both of you uh, embrace the future. I will include myself in that. We're technologists. We lo we love what technology has done and can do for the future. Um, and, but at the same time, especially you, Amy, as a futurist we have to grapple with some very difficult challenges that technology brings us. Yeah. And but, uh, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I think you're both very, uh, 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 well aware of the, b both sides of that double-edged sword. So Christina, you have yeah. devices listening in your, your place of residence, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, and I, and I have conflicted things about it, right? Like, I mean, you know, we have them plugged in, but then, yeah, you know, but I, 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 think about that. I'm like, is this good enough? Is, is this something that I really but want? And then you're more like me because you've lived in public for, for a long time. This is true. This is very true. Yeah. If you, if you ever feel like you need to have a, like a conversation, <laughs> do you, have you ever like unplugged your device to have like a private conversation? I haven't. Lisa won't let me a have a idea. device with a camera in the bedroom. Mm. Yeah, I, I oh. don't do that. I don't have, and, and I don't have it in the bedroom. We have um, so many listening I devices in the bedroom that if I say, uh, the A word. One of the words. Several of them word. will. <laughs> no, I'll hear. Right. Bloop, 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 bloop. Uh, By the way, it's a problem yeah, no. in France because the words for with her are avexa. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that's a problem. And in Mexico, yeah. it's a problem because the word for make, echo, et, is also. It, apparently, that's Amazon's reason for having this facility in Romania is the darn French. And Mexicans keep saying the word <laughs> by accident. That's I know funny. mine wakes up all the time for no apparent reason. And so does my Google. Yeah. Yeah. For no. Cortana never wakes up, though, oddly. What do you have Cortana on? They don't have a speaker out. Harmon Carden makes a Cortana speaker. And okay. I have it. Yeah, I don't even I don't even have that. I, yeah, I, don't. <laughs> I have a stack I have a in my office. Things. I have a Google Home Max, which is the biggest. On top yeah. of that, the Echo Show, and then on top of you that, got a little the, uh, rack. It's not even a rack; they're just standing on top of each other. It's some kind I, of like um, crazy boombox. I want to see glue it all together. Yeah. Put a little handle on if, it. If I had a Take social network, I would post a picture of it, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a, I have, I have a few Echo devices. I have um, a bunch of Sonos things that now have the, you know, the Echo things built in. Um, I do have a HomePod, but I mean, who cares about HomePod? Uh, but, or but Siri. Because Siri's terrible. listening because she does wake up sometimes, I, right? Oh, I know she does wake up sometimes. I sometimes wish, I'll yeah, hear she, her babbling. She's in our kitchen and I'll just, I'll go in the kitchen. She's just babbling. <laughs> like she's lost her mind. Like she's talking I, about I will something. Say, I, I will say I do love Siri and my Apple TV, but that's about the only Siri um, that I like. Um, and then I got a Google Home Mini from Spotify because they had like some, oh, if you're in a family account, we'll send you a free one. Right. Um, but I'll be honest, I haven't hooked that one up. I don't know. I, I should. I should put it in. I should put it in the in in one of the places. I don't know. I feel like I'm should, podcasting you know. all the time, no matter what. Somebody. But I listening. think to your point. <laughs> but I think to your point, the whole having to have sort of lived in public thing that might be part of the difference. There's still lines that I will draw, like you said. I don't have cameras, um, you know, in my bedroom or or any of those places. But well, that was my yeah. wife. I would have done it. I I don't care. I do have I do have an Echo Spot in my closet. And what about yeah, smart like mirrors? Spot. Do you, do I, either of you have no, any of that? Because there's a whole. Mirror. I don't. So, but I'm kind of into it. Yeah. Home automation is one of the big trends that we're tracking this year, and so there's a suite of Peloton-like home smart home. Oh yeah. Mirrors. 
Vance. Yeah, I Ryan know the guy. Vance. I know Ryan Vance, who uh, yeah. was a longtime tech TV guy and uh, uh, did the uh, Tony Gonzalez uh, Fit program, is working with them. I can't wait to get one. Are they out yet? The one is out. There's another. The the really cool looking one that I have a feeling I would rip right off of. The, I don't know how it doesn't because yeah, it has off stuff attached the, to it. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, this is kind of the point, right? I, I think we that we are trading cool and convenience um, for a willing and willful ignorance about what happens on the back end. And I think we're all doing it. I mean, if 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 the three You're of right. us are doing it and we're hyper connected Everybody and is. we understand, think of the implications for people who are moving into Amazon homes. Amazon and Lennar have, Lennar is America's largest home builder. They've partnered um, and are building smart homes that don't just have a few Alexa device, a word, sorry, devices, but have. Imagine um, you're, oh, I'm sorry. Things. I started no, playing no, the, I mean, this is the tonal You know, the device. smart thing, um, actually a, a friend of mine um, successfully led um, her apartment complex and, 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 and they're a big, you know, the kind of chain of building, uh, you know, uh, I guess management to not install the smart locks as she's a security professional. And she was very, very she's right. adamantly. Right. And she is right. Because, and look, to me, that is one of those places where I would completely not be okay with that, where it, yeah. I'm being told you have to have this smart lock installed. You don't have any alternative. This is what we're going to do. We can enter your, you know, house at any time, especially when the, then the security behind those has been so easily hacked and whatnot. Like, yeah, I, but I don't come like on. That. I mean, um, aren't locks just a suggestion anyway? I true. mean, it's just a social yes. norm. It's not really. And there's windows. If somebody wants to break <laughs> you, in there, somebody no, wants to get into your not, house. If somebody doesn't mind you know, breaking the social norm, they can get into your house. Doesn't right. matter I what can, you but about. I mean, this is where it's useful to like look at the bigger constellation of of things. So Amazon has also invested in prefab home companies, you know. In oh, yeah, they have a whole system, so. right? They, the whole house is smart. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. Like I, we're quibbling right now over smart whether or not we have a camera in our bedroom. And I guess what I'm trying to say is unless we change how we think about this, it's inevitable that we will all have camera that will all constantly be under persistent surveillance, which in some ways I think are great, but we don't have all of the back end legal infrastructure and privacy infrastructure, all that other stuff in place yet. The technology as usual is pushing far ahead of our capacity to think about what it all means. Right. I mean, and but, but the one thing I would say that kind of gives me hope a little bit with this, because of course you're completely right, but there does seem to be kind of a breaking point where people are pushed too far. And I mean, Facebook is going through that right now, where for many, many years, many of us never expected that the public would ever turn against Facebook, despite all the different things that they were doing and all the different, you know, uh, breaches that were happening. And then with, with the combination of Cambridge Analytica and and the, you know, involvement with Myanmar and, and uh, you know, the, the ridiculous, um, you know, amount of other atrocities, you know, less people are using them. They have actually seen fewer people signing into, you know, standard Facebook. Now they still have their myriad of other services that they can get all kinds of information from, but there is this palpable kind of backlash against that. And so, you know, it's about finding that that balance. But I, but I think to your point, yeah, when even those of us who know better are still willing to take, you know, the, the, the bad parts, even knowing what can potentially be bad about being in this you know, always on surveilled society, like what chances anyone else have? I mean, I even think about myself. So I travel a lot. And and before the show, uh, you know, you both were talking, you both travel a lot as well, you know, with biometrics and whatnot, with, you know, the amounts of times I go through airports, you know, I use, I use clear, I'm in these other things, like my photo, my fingerprints, other information about me is maintained and in unknowing, un, an uncountable number of databases, you know, um, my, my passport information, my photos, all that stuff as I travel through airports and it's now being held by foreign governments. And that's not even something that I have the opportunity to opt out of, right? Like that's just, if you want to fly through someplace, that's what you have to do. Aren't you just um, tempted to give up at some point? I mean, have you given up or yeah. no? I mean, I have and I haven't. It's it's like I'll have certain things that I, I will, but yeah, there's a certain amount of malaise, I think, and fatigue with all of it. Um, Fighting it is so sure. hard. And, and ultimately, it you have to move to a cabin in the woods. Or you or you try to create systemic change, which so is that's my, what you do. And I like that. I am. Um, because I, I uh, to me, giving up is tantamount to uh, giving up on our futures. The like, big nine. I'm not willing to do gentlemen. that. Amy's book is all about that.
Well, because we can, we can, I don't, I don't want to like the, if you like stop for a moment and just think about what's the worst possible feeling you could have for me, it's regret like that. That is the worst. Um, and I, I don't want to be 30 years from now looking like feeling a horrific sense of regret that we could have taken a different path and we could have chosen, we could have chosen to slow down for five seconds and figure out how can everybody still make plenty of money? Um, mm-hmm. you know, but, but, but how do, how does everybody, how can we make this so that everybody wins and doesn't, you know, everybody w- wins a little more and loses a little less. I don't want to be filled with regret that I didn't play my part. I, I didn't do something when I could have, like, that's the worst, that regret, that's like the worst feeling because what it, where it comes from is a place of there, there was something that I could have done differently, or I didn't have to make that mistake, you know, and I, yeah. I could have, I could have had a better outcome. I don't want to. I don't want to be in that place. Um, so that's why I, I've I refuse even, to give up. I've even given up on regret. I just know I'm going to regret this. That's <laughs> 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 just life. Uh, regrets I've had a few. You haven't. That's why we're talking about this stuff. <laughs> we could have spent yeah, the whole no, time I, I, about Apple. You know, I think there's a good chance LED screens. that we'll end up in the world of idiocracy where I think we're assuming that all this stuff is going to work and then that, that we're going to make a yeah. perfect surveillance uh, system and it's going to know everything about us. There's the, also the option. Here's the uh, smart home that Lennar is building with Amazon. This is the yep. pantry. It's lined with something that no longer exists, dash buttons. The, yeah, they thought, oh, this will be great. In the pantry, we'll put dash buttons next to everything and then you press the button when you run out, except Amazon stopped making them. Yeah, right, but well, and I feel like we're creating a janky future that's just going to break down. That's again, yeah. like look at the bigger picture. There's sensor technology being built inside of materials that mm-hmm. are in our pantries, so you don't right. need a dash button if you, as long as you it put was, your stuff. It was back just in the early sink. technology that we, yeah, it's like well, a right, Las Vegas hotel is, where as soon as you take it off the shelf, the mini bar you're thing, paying right, for the mini, you're paying for it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, I mean, look, I, I I had a bunch of dash buttons and I loved the idea of them in theory, and I did actually hack them so that they could be used nice. for other things, which was really fun. Um, but that the problem was right, like okay, so you get them for toilet paper. That's a perfect thing to get them for, except you don't think about the fact that you need toilet paper until you're on your. <laughs> Last just or it's stay there for and a day or two and it will be right. delivered well and and that's the issue right at that point you're like okay oh. i'm gonna actually have to run down the street and buy toilet paper rather than waiting for prime to come now if they had integrated the dash buttons with prime now like the yes, same day delivery thing where, that's right right where like because i use prime now all the time and way too much. And, and at that point I'm like, oh, I can get this in an hour if I pay another $5, done. Like that would be useful, but it, it wasn't. So, you know, I did enjoy my Haribo one though because I had one for the gummy bears. Um, oh, that's dangerous. Like, can, can I well, offer yes. a totally unrelated tangent? That's funny, but yes. related to gummy bears. Always. Okay, so where I grew up, I grew up on the, I grew up in Northwest Indiana, just outside of Chicago. And there's this uh, gummy bear factory called Albany's and they make uh, both regular gummy bears and sugar-free gummy bears. Oh, do not do the sugar-free gummy bears. Oh my, the sugar-free ones are so bad. Oh no, oh no, oh no. If you want to have a really good laugh, go on to Amazon and look at the reviews for the sugar-free gummy bears. Gummy bears. It's like, oh my God. It's like the, it'll be like the best 10 minutes you've spent ever. Let's, for those who are wondering what could possibly go wrong. And it's totally the, true. The fake uh, sweetener they use has a oh, slightly God. laxative effect. You can slightly. imagine the rest. <laughs> yeah. Well, if yeah, you only eat it's one, you're way. okay. If you eat like three to four of those. It's explosive. And, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, it's, it's very yeah. explosive. We, we, we had the somebody who actually- sell them in five pound bags. It's the best Amazon review ever. Oh, yeah. yeah no, They're, that's what I'm saying. Because I buy the five pound regular bags all the time and you have to make sure you don't get the sugar free ones because yes, there was actually, we had somebody, um, <laughs> I think it was a Gizmodo who like knowingly did a review of them and think, oh, it can't be that bad. And then it was worse than anyone could have ever imagined. So the top positive review on Haribo sugar-free classic gummy bear one pound bag is the horror at 30,000 feet. The top critical review is one of the worst days of my life. But, but that's, that's the Haribo. You need the Albanese. Albanese A-L-B- is worse? No, no, no. Yeah, that's that's where the hilarious ones. A-L-B-A-N-E-S-E. Oh, you seem fairly hilarious. Okay, Albanese. 
Yeah. So this is the this is the hometown favorite. It is. The results are noxious and disgusting. Use at your own risk and be prepared for a fate worse than death. So all those 561 critical reviews are hilarious, detailed accounts about. Partly because they sell them in five pound bags. Yeah. Yeah. Big There's mistake. a really funny one that's like, why would you sell this in a five pound bag? <laughs> <laughs> the night of 1000 waterfalls. That's a good one. <clears throat> Like distant thunder. <laughs> Just don't, unless it's a gift for someone you hate. <laughs> These are good for losing 10 pounds. <laughs> All right, so we won't buy these. I didn't realize that there was an alternative to Haribo. When you need them. Well, the funny yeah. thing is, even though they're sugar-free, they have exactly the same caloric count as non-sugar-free, so... What are they using for the sweetener? Uh, who even knows? Uh, but it's something, something bad. bad. Something don't you don't want to eat. Uh, <laughs> the regular ones are good. They're flavorful. They're flavorful. They're delicious. It's in the heart of everything we do. It's not just on our bag. It's at the heart of everything we do. They're like a family-run company. I feel so that's bad been there for forever. Them. Yeah. Yeah. They're using erythritol or some sort of sugar alcohol, I'm sure. Oh, malitol. That is actually literally baby laxative. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's good. It's the number one ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> That's so messed up. <laughs> Yum. All right. Uh, let's take a little tiny break. Um, Amy Webb <laughs> Here, I'm looking for your big book. I want to get this. Now, you sent it to me, but people can get it themselves, right, from the Future Today Institute? Tech Talk Report? Um, yes. This is available for free online. We give away all of our research. Uh, we, we always print up some for our clients. And so I've got, like, we have a handful. If you want to buy a hard copy, you can go to our website. But you can download it for free. It's so, huge. yeah, you can make your own printout if you if you want. Yeah. I mean, it's a ream of paper, but yeah. <laughs> Future, Future Today Institute. But Amy is... I'm even more excited about this than the five-pound bag of uh, gummy bears you said you're going to send me. Um, she said she's sending me one. I can't wait. Uh, and also, uh, Film Girl, it suddenly yes. got dark in... Uh, it suddenly got dark. So during the break, I'm going to turn on the... So the lights in the building go off at a certain period of time. So uh, uh, during the break, I'm going to switch them back on again. Yeah, they're trying to like, you know, save the environment or something, save money. But uh, I will go reset that in just a second. That's good. I'm taking a break. Here's something you would love, by the way, in your uh, team space. How many people are in that team space? It varies. I mean, I think we've got like six desks, but... Okay, you need a molecule air freshener for sure in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have this in our house. It's funny because uh, Lisa, we were in Hawaii... I don't know why, no pollen, uh, no runny nose, no headache. The minute she gets home, pollen in the air. Our cats come in, they're yellow. They're they're black cats, but they're coated with yellow pollen. You can see the, around the food bowl, all this yellow pollen. It's that time of year, and we've had a big rainy season, so it's an allergy nightmare. Thank God we have the molecule. This saved our lives. We've had the molecule now for a couple of years, and it's fun because... Uh, if it if if somebody turns it off or we go away, Lisa knows immediately. But when that's running, it is a miracle. Molecule is not it's not a HEPA filter. It's reimagining the future of clear air. Uh, it uses something they call Pico technology. The HEPA filter has been around since World War II. It's a filter, literally, and it can trap big particles, but not the little ones that can cause some of the worst allergies and other problems, health problems. The PICO technology, short for photoelectrochemical oxidation, goes well beyond what a HEPA filter will do. It not only captures allergens, okay, HEPA filter might do that, but it eliminates them. Mold, bacteria, viruses. Viruses, particles so small, they go right through a HEPA filter, trapped and eliminated. Even airborne chemicals, volatile organic compounds, like formaldehyde from your carpet or fumes from paint. Pollutants 1,000 times smaller than those a HEPA filter can catch. Molecules technology has been personally effective and verified by science and used by real people like us, including allergy and asthma sufferers around the country. Uh, we have a, a, uh, my son has a friend who uh, has asthma 
comes with his breather, his inhaler. He never needs to use it when he's in our house. We like it so much we got one for Michael's bedroom. We now have one in the studio, too. It's amazing. The, fun, the technology was funded by the EPA. It has been tested by third parties and university laboratories like the University of South Florida's Center for Biological Defense, Minnesota University's Particle Calibration Laboratory. Really beautiful. It's a solid, sleek aluminum. It's kind of like the apple of air uh, purifiers. Very easy to change the filters. It has two filters, a pre-filter and then that Pico filter, which is, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, a catal it's almost like a catalytic converter. It captures the particles, and then UV light burns the particles up. It's really kind of remarkable. Plus, you can tie it to your Wi-Fi network or a Bluetooth network, control it via Bluetooth. It has controls on the top, but if you want to do it with your phone. And the nice thing about tying it to your Wi-Fi, it'll automatically order new filters when you need them, auto-refills. Molecule's amazing. We're going to get you $75 off your first order. And if you've hear, heard these ads before and went and saw that they were sold out, they now have them in stock. They do sell out fast, though, so go to Molecule with a K, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot -E com, and use the promo code TWIT1. It's a new promo code, TWIT1, at checkout for $75 off your first order. Don't just capture allergens. Destroy them with Molecule. You'll thank me later. Molecule.com, promo code TWIT, and the number 1, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E. -E. Uh, and we thank them for their support. Here's the... Um, this is the the gym on the wall that you were talking about, Amy. It's called the tunnel. Yeah. yeah. So this is a smart mirror. I don't know if I this is what I want, but um, I thought I just, a smart mirror would just say, "Hey, you look good today." Or, or <laughs> there's that, another one. There's there are a couple out there where they this looks like it's just showing the ones that I've seen, and I can't remember the brand. This has um, stuff on them. Looks though. at what you're doing, and yeah. then automatically changes the tension and oh, tells you to move your posture xbox and, yeah. used to do that i like that with the connect it right yep. it would know your heart rate it would know if you're working hard enough it would adjust it based on that that really killed me when they killed that product i thought that was a great product it was great it had good stuff for sure just shows you sometimes but people freaked out but people freaked out like when xbox why? one came out people freaked out about the the connect stuff and the always on stuff like and and, and a lot of the things people were like not into it so yeah so, Apple bought the company, was an Israeli company, and it's in the front of your iPhone 10 and 10s. I know, and it's funny because, uh, you know, Windows Hello has a lot of that same stuff with it, too, and it's great. Um, I'm yeah. always Wait, amazed Connect? by how... I thought, yeah, Apple I thought bought the Connect was a... Was it just only ever a subsidiary? I thought no, it no, no, was. No, they didn't buy Connect. They bought the company that did the foundation, uh, foundational technology for Connect. Oh, okay. right. Apple stole like them the out. Company that, that made the the, the, the camera, um, yeah. the like the 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 three dimensional kind of IR camera sort of tech yeah. for the very mm -hmm. first Connect. The the second Connect, the Connect for the Xbox One, was made, I think, in house. But Pro the Prime Sense Connect. was the uh, sensor. Prime company. Sense, yes. Prime Sense, mm -hmm. um, and Apple uh, <laughs> Apple bought them, which is kind of weird. That Microsoft, I guess Microsoft knew. Well, well I mean, although, I mean, uh, it, like I said, I think it was done in-house because uh, the, the second Connect was made by a different, uh, right. was made with different stuff. And and Windows Hello is largely the same idea. And um, yeah, once you get the idea, it's not probably too hard to. Yeah. Windows Hello always impresses me, but it, it can be like at a weird angle and it, it'll still, as long as I'm not out in bright sunlight, it'll recognize me basically anywhere um i wish i had face id on my laptop i mean touch id is fine but but there is something about just having to like casually glance up and automatically be logged in that's very nice so i got a new windows laptop i got that new thinkpad and uh it i have the choice between all the different because <laughs> it has a it has a hello camera it has a hello finger per reader i could also do the there's like eight ways to log in and I'm using the fingerprint, but you know what I think? Hel is hello as secure? Um, the the face yes. recognition as secure as a fingerprint? Is it good? Yeah, it's the exact same. I mean, it's the exact same encryption. So okay. whether you're using the fingerprint sensor or the no, camera, but I mean, it's the somebody can't. My twin can't unlock it, right? Actually, I don't uh, have a twin, so that probably is true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think your twin probably could unlock it. That was a problem with Apple's it, iPhone 10, right? The, the family yeah, members were able to unlock it. Well, I mean, I think it's a problem with anything. If you have an identical twin, yeah, like they're probably going to be able to use their facial thing to do it probably yeah, honestly yeah, if you yeah. but that's if you have like an identical twin it's not enough to be 
you look alike. Like even fraternals, it, it might not work. But if you have an identical twin, I mean, there you was. Also have the same- when, I, DNA, so you know. Right. One of these when the people. iPhone 10 came out, there were a mother and son, and he could unlock. His, in fact, wait a minute, Megan Maroney's son could unlock her iPhone 10. Come to think of it, huh? Yeah, that's and, interesting. And they're identical you, twins, so they could unlock each other, and they could unlock her. So it's. I think, as I remember, it does things like this, uh, spacing between the eyes. It does the geometry right. of the face. It's doing. You know, all these weird things. And then it's changing things every time you're right. using it, updating. So, you know, the fingerprint sensor is obviously really fast, too, because one of my laptops, my Huawei doesn't have a um, face ID or doesn't have the, the Windows oh, Hello Oh, but it camera. has a better fingerprint reader, though, I think. Yeah, but it has a but it does have the Windows Hello fingerprint reader. Right. So it's that's very good. instantly yeah. like it's super fast. Um, but, uh, you know, um, on my service book, obviously, that has Windows Hello. And it's interesting how even as your hair changes or makeup or, or, you know, weight or whatever, like it continues to just be able to pick it up. And, this, uh, and work. It does. I know why. See, the problem. This is a desktop, the Surface Studio. And I, mm -hmm. every time I want to log in, I either have right. to lean over it like lurch or or raise it up so that it can see me because mm -hmm. it has to be at the right angle so there is a disadvantage to having it there on is a desktop, yeah i was gonna say i have the screen. same issue with my um with my ipad pro because you kinda, if i'm like laying in bed with it right and i've got it at a weird yeah. thing that i have to like sit up Hold exactly up. i've got right. the same sort of situation yeah yep. yep. uh, so you know that uh walmart has a smart shopping cart did i talk to you about this last no. time i was on so oh, that's interesting how smart uh, is it? So real smart. So it's not in production yet, um, but they've they've built a concept for a shopping cart that collects basic biometrics once you get to the store. So you would lay your hands on the shopping cart and it takes a baseline. <laughs> Put your hands on the shopping Put your hands cart. On the cart. Uh, it takes a baseline reading of your heartbeat, your perspiration, the tension what? that you're holding the cart with. Why? Um, and obviously, there are also cameras all around the store. And I think the idea is as you move throughout the store, it looks for fluctuations. So if you get to aisle seven and you're trying to find <gasps> your Captain Crunch and you're ready to, you know, you can't find it and you're ready to blow a gasket. Um, My heart always pounds when I get to the Captain Crunch aisle. There is a uh, <laughs> no. That's really that is really smart. Holy you know who God. comes over to help you find it, but obviously there's data being. You know, now, lined. are they pitching this to say, oh, and it could save your life if you have a heart attack at our store, or no? You know, I don't. Uh, I don't know what they're <laughs> pitch. I don't. I don't think so at the moment. But here's the. I mean, you guys are giving away your faces and your fingerprints and to, everything. Mm -hmm. We don't. We don't. You know, what happens if one of these companies gets bought or sold, right? I mean, because we're true. sort of black, we're kind of like lackadaisical about our all of our biometrics as well as our DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, no, right? that's, that, that's why I haven't done any of those DNA um, kits, frankly, even though I would really like the information from them and I think it would be really good. I haven't done it. That's kind of where I draw the line. My fingerprint stuff, I don't really have a say in the matter in some of the cases, you know, especially if you're, if you're you know, like I said, if you're traveling a lot or whatever, but... Um, for some of the, in my, my face, I certainly don't, but, uh, my DNA is the no, one. I mean, thing our faces like, are like, they're in camp, like, right. But like some of this other, I mean, well, I don't did know. you, did there you read in today's, um, New York times, a privacy project, Sarah Jong writing about, she, at first I thought, you know, the title is AI is changing insurance. Some technologies are better left in the laboratory. At first I thought, oh, she, oh, I'd like to know what is insurance. It, it, this is more a potential threat. Mm -hmm. um, but this is something, if I'm Dvorak, you know, whenever we talk about privacy, this is always the example he would use. Well, you know, you go buy donuts a lot. If the GPS says you're always at the Dunkin' store, you're right. going to have a hard time getting insurance. But maybe this is uh, what insurance companies are planning to do. Oh, completely it is. I mean, that, that's always been, I mean, they'll give you the subsidized Apple Watch or Fitbit or, or Fitbit knockoff, which is- Yeah, they have, what, that's uh, real. They offer, if you use a right. Fitbit, you can get a reduction in life insurance, right? Right, right, right. Because my parents, for instance, like, a, I guess, whatever their thing is, like my dad had like a knockoff Fitbit and he, it broke and he didn't like it. So for his birthday, which was um, like a week and a half ago, I bought him whatever the latest, greatest Fitbit was. I was like, here you go. John, um, John so Hancock did this last year, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and but you know, and that's a good thing. You can get you can get reduced, you know, rates and whatnot. But then you do wonder, okay, 
at least for now, how it's worked is that they'll just give you kind of, you know, like a, you know, some, some, uh, you know, like a, a, a lower premium or whatever, um, regardless of what your health is. But then you wonder, okay, are they going to start trying to gather the information from that? And at least right now they're not, but that's, got to be the next level, right? Which is they're saying, oh, you know, if you're, if we're seeing this sort of activity, then we can anticipate that you'll have, you can have lower premiums, but the inverse is true too. If we see, you know, this type of activity, then we will charge you more. That I'm not super jazzed about. And I say this as somebody who by, you know, all accounts would, would be on the lower uh, premium scale, at least for things like, you know, like heart disease and cholesterol and, and, blood pressure and whatnot. I'm, I'm waving at you from the other end of that scale. Hello. Right, right, right. Well, here's, but, I, I'm, but, so, you know, I have a picture this, to, right? Picture yeah. this. You're, you're wearing devices. You're in, you're, you're effectively plugging into Apple and, or Apple and Google and Amazon or some combination. And those companies increasingly are mining and refining health data because they're increasingly offering their own health things or they're starting to build their yeah, own Sam, health my things. Samsung as a health app, to, right, I so know it's monitoring everything because I can well, so here's the Here's the concern that I have. The concern that I have is that all this technology that we've been talking about today, 10 years from now or perhaps, you know, maybe five years from now, makes a decision that um, I haven't burned enough calories and it's somebody's decided to optimize and nudge me into better health and therefore I can't open my garage door and drive to work. I have to take my bike or walk. But you would or do that because you get a 30% discount in your insurance. But, but for again, me, like, I mean, it, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is kind of a serious point is because the, the problem is that um, decision-making technologies are by de design inflexible and right. there's always context. So sure, there are days that I'm feeling like lazy and I don't want to move and I don't want to exercise and I just want to eat whatever and be left alone. Um, you know, there are other days when there may be very real reasons that I cannot, like mm -hmm. right now I've got two broken ankles, right? And oh, no. um, there's no Did you no jump way out of an airplane without a parachute? Yeah, it's, a long, it's a long story. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I fell off of a stage. Oh, oh God! But then, Yikes. like, but then, like David Grohl, I picked up my guitar and I kept rocking. Said I'm okay, kind of. And then I, then you, you know, have to go off. in for surgery in a couple yeah. weeks. But it, my, right. my point is, like, um, my foot hurts, you know, and I, I technically can walk, but it hurts really badly to walk right now. So you shouldn't. And the thing is that that our our smart devices doesn't know again. That. Like, yeah. you have to start thinking this through. It's not just about insurers cost you charging less money uh, oh, or, but or more money. We'll make but, it possible but, um, for you to call and ask for a waiver today. But think of your number 43. These, and your I mean, call I, is the, important to us. <laughs> my, my concern is that there's relatively like a few number of people who are making these decisions about what our best lives and our most optimized lives are, who, who don't have as wide a cultural perspective as I might like, who can't possibly think through every possible, That's right. you know, variable, and we don't have overwrite capacity. So, and terms of service are changing all the time. And if you're not, if you don't have like an eagle eye paying attention to all of this, you miss it. And I, my, my concern is for, my concern is always for everyday people, everyday people who yeah. are caught in the middle of all of this stuff, whose lives wind up unintentionally worse off because there wasn't transparency or nobody thought that, you know, explaining things was all that important or that they were just going to force them to live their best life, their best, healthiest life. And therefore we were going to use their data in this way. I just, you know, there's, there's always external circumstances that we got to take into account. I 1000% agree. I mean, and, and you're right. And we don't do a good enough job of the way that we train these models. And there isn't really um, the the push to train them better. Where, like you said, we, we look at those nuances and where people think about what the potential consequences are. And and um, even if, you know, my personal circumstances right now are, wouldn't be negatively impacted, doesn't mean that they couldn't be down the line or that I even want it to be part of consideration at all. You know, um, because a lot of times the data doesn't even show what, people want to read from it. You know, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. It, it, these things can have long-term negative in, um, impacts on, on, on our society that um, we don't take into account and, and that doesn't have enough scrutiny because people are thinking, oh, look at how great this is and look at how much this will be optimized and how much more productive mm -hmm. we'll be. But well, we and really more importantly, I think it's clear that insurance companies need to be more profitable. 
Somebody actually just in the IRC wrote, KV just wrote, it's a privacy tax on the poor. And I think that's oh. a really smart. Oh, completely. That's, an you know, that's completely accurate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think it's a privacy tax on the poor and, the, and those Why? who Explain either. Explain that. Pardon? Explain how it's a privacy tax. Yeah. So I don't think it is at the moment, but I think it will be increasingly. If you've got all of these devices um, and so, so the way that I like to think about this is, you know, Apple charges a premium. Um, but Apple's devices are the, the privacy is fairly short up and people understand what data probably is, is moving around and where but that's not the case with all of these other devices. And if you're somebody who wants to be connected but can't afford to buy into Apple's ecosystem, yep. um, you know, then your data are more likely to be extracted and mined and refined and given away. So but but it's not like entirely transparent that that's what's happening. Right. Um, you know, in the health device so if you if you're somebody who can't afford to pay or you need to pay less for your insurance for whatever reason, um, think you know, and you're willing to give up your data. I mean, it is. It's kind of like a privacy tax. In we other words, you you have worse insurance. It'll pay more for insurance if you can't afford to have the fancy monitoring stuff. Or you're trying to just pay less for whatever reason, exactly. and you don't understand what you're giving up in the process, right? Yeah. Right. Well, and it's not just the poor. I would also say the elderly because like my parents are both of the age where I guess they're on, they're on um, a, a Medicare or whatever. Um, uh, and, you know, that's what's offering, I guess my dad gets his free Fitbit thingy or whatever, you know, and, and obviously once you're at, you know, once you're at retirement age and whatnot, you know, and you're, you're living off of your retirement, off of your savings, off of whatever stipends you're getting, that's going to go into consideration too. So I think it's the poor and the elderly and we're all going to be older at one point, regardless of what we do. So yeah. Well, how there about this? There is an optimistic framing here though. How about this? Oh, a new policy proposal by the Trump administration calls for the surveillance of disabled people's social media profiles to determine the necessity of their disability oh, benefits. The proposal- that's which aims That's to horrific. cut down on the number of fraudulent disability claims would monitor the profiles of disabled people and flag content that shows them doing physical activities. That's horrific. Uh, That's or how horrific. about this? Here's a, a patent application from State Farm uh, for, they call it the aggregation and correlation of data for life management purposes. It's a, uh, a plan for aggregating home data, vehicle data, and personal health data to help you have a better life. <laughs> of course, State Farm's interest is not in having you have a better life. No, it's not. <laughs> so I, I, was, so I was hit by the car. <laughs> look, look so I was hit, I was look hit by a diagram. car a year and a half ago. <laughs> so I'm dealing with insurance stuff right now because I was uh, some, some idiot – drove his car into me when I was crossing the street in a pedestrian crosswalk, and I, I – This is separate from the bus purpose. incident? This was the bus. Oh, incident. okay. So I, he, I was hit by the car thrown under the bus. And, uh, and so I'm dealing with insurance right now with his insurance company and, and it's a whole thing. And my God, like if it, I mean, and already it's dealing with they're, they're trying to kind of be like, Oh, it wasn't that bad. You went to work the next day. And I was like, well, yeah, because I'm dumb. And because I didn't, you know, like, oh, yeah. I was so there you go. They got you. Not. I'm like, I'm like, I still couldn't write. I, I couldn't use, I'm right-handed. I couldn't type. I couldn't use my wrist for, for you know, like sufficiently. Like I've got all kinds of evidence and everything. But there was yeah, a Jack they, Lemon they movie many my... years ago called The Fortune Cookie. Jack Lemon's an insurance examiner following a guy around on crutches to find out if he really is hurt. Here's the, by the way, this I... is a brilliant, a brilliant patent application. Here's, here's you, Christina. Yeah. <laughs> here's your car. Here's your house. It all goes into the cloud the brain where a computing device which includes a processor memory and user interfaces processes it mm -hmm, puts it back down in the data processor <laughs> so that we can i don't judge. know manage your life <laughs> yeah judge so that we can judge i need a picture of the judging so i'm going to say this once again Everybody loves to point the finger at China and China's social credit system yes. and you know wow that's crazy thank god we don't live there and you know, we're, we're, ours is just not that coordinated. Um, right. But, but, but you're crazy to think that, th and the, the, the thing that really gets me um, is that it's happening in slow motion right in front of our eyes. Yeah. And we marvel at it and we fetishize the future and we don't take any action. Right. Um, and again, like, 
let's just this is where things get sticky because uh we have to be able to mine and refine and automate some of these processes in order to do things like um, use machines to help us figure out cures to cancer, like to 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 do all of these amazingly difficult, wicked, you know, problem solving that that we that we want to accomplish. That that's possible. That's on the horizon. But we got to figure out a way to do this without our consumerism getting in the way and our you know strong desire to make a buck every, you know, well, thank again, goodness. Like, this is complicated because these companies are public and they need to, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. We got to sort this stuff out. I'm just uh, grateful that Google has decided to create an AI ethics board uh, yeah, was, to manage yeah. this. It's going oh, so well. Oh, wait a minute. So well. <laughs> they canceled it. Uh, one, one week later. <laughs> That was uh, uh, never mind. It was only going to meet four times a year anyway. So doomed from the start. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. That They're, was the strangest assemblage of people that I've. I, I mean, uh, like that was a weird. That was yeah. weird from from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, let's take <laughs> let's take a break, and uh, we'll be back with more. First, before we do anything, we should. I I wasn't here last week, and I and I've asked. Uh, we put cameras everywhere in the building, and I've asked our team to put together a surveillance video of what I missed this week on Twit. Let's Previously watch together. On Twit. This was part of my pirate uh, costume oh. that I wore for Halloween, I think a couple years ago. Right, your Johnny Depp costume? <laughs> That's what everybody said, but I was like, no, I'm just a standard <laughs> pirate because it's Johnny Depp. Yeah. No, not no. him. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. All about Android. Look at this gaming laptop of a phone. Oh. <laughs> is a gamer phone. Is a cool. Now, why are there connectors on the sides of mm, this case? Interesting. Because intellectual property be damned. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Uh, cool. The Black Shark 2 is the device that's really interesting. Tech News Weekly. According to a new Gallup poll, 61% of people polled believe that they use their phone less than the people around them. That's 61% of people believe that they use their phone less. In reality, in my case, it's true. Am I part of the problem? <laughs> I wouldn't consider you part of the problem, but I think you're lying to yourself, <laughs> probably. You know what you do do? What? We share an office and you talk to your Google Assistant a lot, and I think you're talking to me. And there needs oh. to be a word. Like, you're just like, remind me to get the laundry. I was like, I'm not going to remind you to get the laundry. <laughs> Twit. Technology isn't always pretty, but we are. Aw. Jason Howell. How is that phone life. not getting, how are they not getting sued by Nintendo? Oh, yeah, because it's exactly the same as the it's Nintendo Switch. Switch. Yeah. yeah. No, it looks pretty Nintendo's cool. Nintendo's getting sued by Game Shark over. The, really? Yes. For real? <laughs> For real, yeah. That's the Shark oh too. So Game Shark did it first. Yes. There then are, Nintendo there, did it. Then Game Shark. There are people suing Nintendo. That's nuts. I didn't know that. See? It's it's uh it's something called uh there's a there's a phrase for it reverse confusion when a company comes along I don't know some let's say you had a podcast network called Twit and a company comes along and names itself similarly and then becomes really big and successful then people just assume that you little Twit copied the big successful company when in fact it was Game Shark that had the idea all along. <laughs> Our show today. <laughs> you like my uh, like my beads? Our show today brought I to you. <laughs> I got this at a luau, and I got this when we checked in. Our show today brought to you by Express VPN. You better believe when I'm on the road. If I am on an app and Wi-Fi access point, you know we get to the hotel and they say, "Oh, hey, good news. You just go ahead and use the Wi-Fi. There's no password. There's no anything. Just go ahead and use it." That's crazy. That means I'm on the same network as everybody else at that hotel and anybody who's sitting anywhere nearby because everybody can use it. That's when you fire up the VPN. And you better believe I fired up ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that will protect you on public Wi-Fi. If you leave that internet connection unencrypted, you might as well be writing your password and your credit card numbers on a billboard for the rest of the world to see. ExpressVPN protects you by encrypting all the traffic from right through that hotel's Wi-Fi all the way from your computer to the ExpressVPN servers. And by the way, servers all over the world, 160 different locations. So you could choose a server near you or you could choose a server that's in the country you want to emerge in. If, if you're 
in, you know, uh, a foreign land and you want to use your Netflix, no problem. Just, you know, use the Express VPN server in the U.S. and you're there. You're secured. You're anonymized. Your data is encrypted. And very important when you're looking for a VPN, Express VPN does no logging. They are not tracking you. So if you're worried that you're being tracked by your ISP or your carrier, if you're worried that you're being snooped upon, if you're worried that you're being attacked, get ExpressVPN. They have simple apps that run on any iPhone, Android phone, Mac, or PC. One button click and you're protected and safe. And it's less than $7 a month for the number one VPN service, according to Tech Radar, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So... Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash twit. Express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, expressvpn.com slash twit. Don't ask me how to spell VPN. Expressvpn.com slash twit. Three extra months with a one-year subscription. We thank them for their support. We thank you for supporting them and thereby supporting us. YouTube... Uh, struggling a little bit um, because there's a lot of video on there that advertisers don't want to buy and they're getting a lot of heat for a lot of weird things. So according to Bloomberg, they're now trying a new metric Bloomberg calls responsibility. Two new internal metrics at YouTube introduced over the last two years to do, figure out how well videos are performing, not how many subscribers, not how many views, one tracks the total time people spend on YouTube, including comments they post and read, not just clips. The other is a measurement called quality watch time. Uh, and the goal is, anyway, to spot content that achieves something more constructive than just keeping you watching. Is this a sensible plan from YouTube's point of view? One of the problems people have with YouTube is the recommendation engine that slowly pushes you towards more and more extreme content in order to increase your watch time. This sounds like a, this is Google's uh, attempt to get around that. Thoughts? Christina? I mean, it's, it's not... It's not, it's not a bad, it's not a bad option to go to, I guess. You Did know, you I mean, ever like consider you being a YouTube star, Christina? If I were 10 years younger, totally. What does that have to do with it? I think I'm too old. I think I'm too old, but... Um, How old do you uh, yeah. have to be? You're a kid. What, do you have to be 12? Uh, I, I think you yes. I, I think you definitely need to be, like, in your early 20s. <laughs> yeah, like, I think you need to be in your early 20s. Like, but oh, no if I were 10 years younger, I think that would have been the direction I would have gone that in. explains why I can just never get my YouTube numbers up. We have a we have a family friend that's grooming... Let me... It's not my family. It's my husband's family knows people. Um who are grooming their 11 or 12 year old to oh, become like an no. influencer. And it's like, what the? It's like <laughs> grooming your kid to be horrifically disappointed in life. <laughs> For real. <laughs> but here's a, but there, there's something analogous to what YouTube is currently doing and what the broadcast industry did. I think just after TV started broadcasting, um, which was, and again, I think this has to do with potential impending regulation. It's proving that um, there's some type of beneficial component to the content that's being aired. Um, so, so that, so the broad, like the original, like when kids programming was first on, the the industry went through that decades and decades ago. Um, where it they had strikes to me as the same thing, though, that every tech company, Facebook's doing this too now, where they throw out ideas that they they have no intention. Uh, you know, they're not going to change anything, but they're so terrified that Congress is going to come down on them. That right. It's basically hand-waving, if you ask me. Yeah, I think so. I I mean, listen, every time... <laughs> so so how are they going to... What, what's the what's the work stream process? Like, I'd love to know exactly how this is yeah, going to work. Yeah, that's very vague. What is a quality... What is quality time? What does that even mean? Right. I don't... How do you judge that? There's no... And who's... Right, and who's defining it and, right. you know... Um, the problem really is, it's the same problem Facebook faces, which is if you, if you, and it's algorithmically easy to do, you optimize for engagement. That's something a computer program can easily do. Optimize for engagement. Mm -hmm. You get, uh, uh, and Facebook experiences in the newsfeed and YouTube's experiencing it in the recommendation engine. And uh, you, it just descends to the lowest, I guess TV went through this too, didn't it? Lowest yeah. possible quality Stuff. Right. When I think of, so again, like when I see, 
first of all, my daughter doesn't. Um, we how, built how old her is she? How old is she? she? She's eight, and as far okay. as she's concerned, so she's prime whole, YouTube material. Right, except that we built her her own network, so she thinks she has free and unfettered access <laughs> to the internet, and we built her like a little Chinese internet inside of our house. Um, That's amazing. So she baby's first Chinese internet. I like it. Yeah, no, she thinks she's uh, she's balling. Like she, you know, she's got it, got all access, and so, you know, surprise. How, now, how do you do this? Do you you do. don't because clearly, like things like parents thought, oh, YouTube kids, that'll be safe, and then they yeah, found out YouTube it's creepy is, as hell. No, it's yep. not. A lot of the content, these, um, my first window into what this world was like was were unboxing videos. And I could not for mm -hmm. the life of me figure out why, because uh, I watched, you know, she, that's what she wanted to watch a couple of years ago. And I, I was just like, what? I don't, I don't understand this. And then I, I don't know if it was in the, I think it was in the New Yorkers. There was a doctor who had written an explanation of why these unboxing videos were so attractive to little kids. And it's because um, at very early ages, their uh, sensory systems and emotional maturity are just starting to tap into the element of surprise and delight. Right. Um, but without the negative repercussions. So it's, so they're, it's like stimulating the part of the brain that's just starting to develop. And um, the, the, that stupid, what's the name of that stupid doll thing? Um, they come in these <laughs> Which big one? Egg, there's big quite spheres. a few of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Kinder eggs? Speak, no, 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 they're not Kinder but eggs. But there's these are like all these spheres. YouTube unwrapping videos of these right. stupid. Yep. These these toys were reverse engineered. Yes. They are, they are um, actual, they were a toy version of an unboxing video. Yes. Uh, and and, be, and you un, there's like a hundred different things to. The Hatchimals? You know, Unbox. No, it's not a Hatchimal. What the hell are these stupid things? <laughs> That's called? a horrible name, whatever that is. At any rate, um, uh, they're right. oh, they're Hatchable. They're Hatchimal collectible. They're not Hatchimals or something else that are all equally. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, so the Great Firewall of Amy. How does this protect her against Hatchimals? Oh, yeah, so, 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 so. Originally, we were like kids, you know, YouTube kids. I guess I was drinking the Kool-Aid along with everybody else. Yeah. How horrible would this be? It's safe. And then I realized, um, you know, some of it is like uh, this kind of programming, which is stimulating in a way. There's also, you know, there's plenty of fine- Are you ready for a super- Sorry, I don't know why my yeah. volume is so high. I'm watching a little Hatchimals. Yeah, it's not, that's actually not it. This is something worse. <laughs> Even worse? Yeah, yeah. It's the oh, Hatchimals oh, unboxing. Oh, oh, what is what it? What it is. What are they called? <laughs> LOL surprise dolls. They are expensive. They are they are horrible. But the, that that is what was reverse engineered. They're brilliant. That, <laughs> both, that's what both. got reverse engineered. Oh, I'm looking at these. Oh, yeah, both Christy and I are, are quickly googling LOL surprise dolls. I got to so, have. So I let pet, so I let her watch YouTube at the beginning, and then I saw what it was. And not all of it's bad. Some of it's bad. Some of it, I think, must have been what. Um, me watching Bill Nye the Science Guy was probably like to my parents. Well, that's and the problem. Remember, How do you judge, right? That's the point. Like Bill Nye the Science Guy was obviously that was educational, that was amazing. But for somebody who was older, it was a lot of jarring, quick cuts and right. loud music and right. big yeah. graphics, which I'm sure a lot of people railed against and, and older people and thought, well, this is horrible. Much like today, we are railing against some of what we're now seeing on YouTube. Was the point that I was trying to get to 20 minutes ago. Anyhow, we don't use yeah, well, and, or, or, or actually, kids. I guess, in, in, if not Bill Nye, I mean, because that's actually educational. This would be more like, you know, Jim and, uh, you know, the, the various uh, um, uh, other cartoons, them? like G.I. Joe, the things that they created, like, when, like, like the animated show Jim, like it was literally created to sell a toy brand, right? Like they created these Saturday morning cartoons with the express purpose of selling toys. So they did the same type of thing where they're like, OK, we're going to create this this TV show that its whole purpose is to launch a toy line. Which but is, I don't know, you know if LOL, I mean, LOL Surprise Dolls is kind of cool, although it's clearly, no, it's, it even says on the doll, unbox me. So, so the whole point of it is, right. So if you watch any more of that, it is an unboxing video that is just made out of plastic. <laughs> so the problem that I have with these is that once, it, it is an activity. So once it's, so. And it does it encourage to kids to create it. their own YouTube channel? I mean, is that, it's, uh, it it um no, no my daughter doesn't want to do that but once you've unwrapped the, it, there is no toy so that the the thing that you do was unbox it you unwrap it in all these different places 
and then you're not going to these that's they, it. They're little tiny you're, you're not going to play with them so all right. we're doing is generating a lot of waste that winds up getting thrown out <laughs> it's a it's a ball full of plastic crap it that is. you're going to throw out later that's right. And they're selling an activity, right? And and these, by the way, are really expensive. But this is somebody who reverse engineered a um, commercially viable oh, uh, internet kind of meme, nice which are glasses. unboxing yeah. videos and oh, has done quite the, well. There's the gauntlets or the boots or something. Yeah. yeah. These are these are like um, the, these little cup. balls that you're seeing get unwrapped. Those <laughs> yeah. things are like 50 bucks. 50 bucks? Some of them, the bigger, the larger that they are, the more expensive. <laughs> the bigger these balls are cost more. Expensive. Yeah. Okay, but you get a doll, see, and then it dresses up. For and fifty dollars. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like that's that's. Okay. No. So this is not clearly Bill Nye, the science guy. Um, no, but my point was like this. But is we the can't judge. YouTube. We're a different generation. I think so, and I and, think and the that problem is your daughter in in fifteen years is not going to be able to talk to her peers about LOL. Surprise there plenty, me, dolls. There, there is plenty of, I think, content on YouTube created by younger kids that is probably educational. Nowhere near what Bill Nye was. Like, no, no, they're not even. There is good so science a, video on YouTube that kids watch. It's not a fair comparison. Yeah. Right. So the question is, um, isn't there value in watching a cartoon that is about, like the, the reboot of She-Ra is amazing. Now that's not on YouTube. That was on Netflix, but it's like- So do you have, so I still want to know about the Great Firewall of Amy. So do you have a, a white list of things she can look at or how does this work? Do you like, yeah, have a Plex, do you have well. a Plex server where you, you stock it we with- We also have that. Yeah, family so, approved videos? So we, yes. So we have- uh, how much do I, how much do I invite the outside world into? <laughs> well, um, just the general gist so somebody yeah, can so duplicate the gist this. Is we have multiple, we have multiple networks that serve different purposes that are all behind different types of firewalls themselves. You are such her, a geek. Her network, my, we, the joke in our family is that my, like my husband is hardware and I'm software, um, <laughs> except when it's a, it's a whole other thing. Um, so so wait, you have VLANs in your house Yes. And, and each and we ran, we bought a hundred year old house. And the first thing we did was run conduit everywhere <laughs> so that smart. we could run our own tables. Yep. yep. Um, so Do you have a closet, like a wiring. We have a beautiful rack in the basement. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Amazing. It's very sunny. And the chic. great firewall of Amy has a beautiful rack in the basement. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very confused like by this because I'm this. making the titles getting longer and longer and longer. No, like it's, I'm not a parent and I'm not going to be one, but this seems like this is the right way if you're going to do it to do it. Because I no, always thought to myself, brilliant. I'm like, well, but no, right. there I is a risk. No, devices. I have to point out there is a risk because the mm -hmm. worldview is created by mom and dad and it is a limited worldview. Now, I understand she's young enough. That's probably OK. And it's normal. But I also know kids who grew up and the only thing they could watch was, um, you know, like Bible verse. Right. Cartoons. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's and, not like that. It's more. We, we want to give her, the, so yes, so she's, we've basically turned the internet off except for white labeled places where she can go. I think that's great, um, honestly. There is no YouTube kids. At what age will uh, you stop this though? I don't know, as she matures, you know, she's eight, she's a pretty, she's an only child. She's a fairly, you know, we're old parents. She's a fairly mature eight-year-old, but we'll right. see. Um, this we reminds me have, a lot of what Stacey Higginbotham does with her daughter, by the way. Yeah, and st so Stacey and I know each other. I mean, I think that there's like a, there is a, there are parents who are sort of, you know, I I don't I don't believe in no screen time. I believe in smart screen time. Cultivated so, screen time. That's right. Curated, so she has curated. access to all of the robots and all of the device. We got all kinds. We got a house full of stuff that she can access, but she's only accessing it on her network. Do you teach her? Are means, you teaching right. her coding? No, they do some of that at school. But I'll tell you what they do at school that's amazing. Um, they have di digital literacy classes where uh, once a week um, they have to learn. You know, Bobby put put a photo without asking Jane, and oh, that's the, really good. That's really they that is to, really like, good. It's part of their values class is uh, digital values, which is amazing. But you know, not every school does that. No, but see what I like about this because see my my whole thing. Most of the peop, most parents that I've talked to who try to do similar things, they don't go to to the extreme you have. But this is smart because I always think about like, what if it were me at that age, and if it were me at that age, I would 
figure out the mom and dad were censoring the internet and I would find out how to like override the system. But this is pretty- She, she this knows. Would, this, would, this would take- Right, <laughs> right, no, I know. Yeah, but we're not I'm hiding it I, from her, she's, she I, totally I'm not knows. saying you are, what I'm saying- what I'm yeah. saying though is that is that I would know and then I would be like, okay, well then what do I need to do to take control of the router? <laughs> exactly. The whole thing. Um, which at that point, I would like to think that if I were a parent, and again, I'm not one and I'm not going to be one, but if I were, I would like to think that if my child did do that successfully, I'd be like, okay, you know what? Congratulations, you deserve this. Yeah, you but, have to earn your way but, out of, uh, of the tech prison. Right. Yeah. But this this is a level uh, above and beyond like what the-, the Most typical, people can't do this. You know, what they no, do is they go the out and point. buy the Disney Circle thing and they let Disney decide. Exactly. This is the and, point and, and that I've been trying Disney to Circle make all night. Easy to get over. Yeah. Right. So the, the problem is that my husband's best friend is a black is a white is a white hat. Um all, you know, we we run in very technical circles and so we're all on key base sharing ideas, parenting, you know, like we're we're in a different kind of situation than than most people. Um, and so, yeah, we all share, we've got a Plex server that everybody shares and there is a like kid approved. Mm -hmm. If you're seven years old, this is the stuff you get to watch. Um, the, the problem is that I'm, I'm in a rarefied group of people and I, I have all this additional knowledge. And, um, my, my point is like, I feel like everybody else should have access to at least the knowledge so that they can then make decisions or they can afford we can make it so that people can afford to buy in. Again, this goes back to the comment somebody made about privacy and taxes and and wealth. Um, you know, if you don't know this stuff or if you can't afford to make alternate choices or build out and provision like six different networks in your home, right? Because you can barely afford the one network that you've got access to in the, the standard modem and router situation, then you're kind of left, um, you're left open. And that's, that's, that, that impacts the future generation of people who grow up, you know. This um, is interesting because this is the opposite of the, the uh, privacy tax for poor people. This is, this, there is a technologically savvy group of adults mm -hmm. who are creating this safe space for a very small, you have to write a book, Amy. And I, well, but I, this I is want you to call it so the great firewall of Amy. Thinking this could be productized, like honestly, but this could be something. The that problem you would, like, is productized is the thing. problem because Disney Circle is going to have right. a corporate bias. I mean, I bet you anything, the new Disney streaming service will be part of the Disney Circle. You know, that's right? why I, I, call, I call like Disney. I mean, like Synology or someone. You know what I mean? Somebody. Like there's there's a there's there's a way to do this if you were like a a, a server company or like Amplify or this, somebody. It you know seems what I mean? to like, me this is the this is the growing gulf between the haves and have nots, except it's the technically literate and the technically right. Illiterate. And this is the problem that I have yeah. with all the people in the Valley who, who are now like the, the new autism, the new, like I'm on the spectrum is my kids get no screens and yeah. they don't use right. any of the products that I work on. Right. Um, and the Which problem that I have on. with that is that they're either being dumb or they're just trying to like, that's a stupid, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like I'm with you. you can't live in a world that doesn't have technology you're obviously tech savvy people. Why would you just sort of go in this weird alternate? It doesn't, it's totally disingenuous or it's it's like Absolutely. intentionally being kind of dumb, you know? Well, and I think a lot and, of it is the same because the same people who used to like when, you know, I was growing up and when you're growing up, your parents would be like, oh, well, my child doesn't watch TV. We don't have a TV in our house, which, you know, was just like, okay, good for you, I guess. <laughs> but- I, I, it's, it seems I can't even know. imagine Christina first. Warren not being able to watch TV. As no, a in teenager. fact, my parents, no, it was so funny is, is that my parents like limited what I could watch to a certain age, you know, and then yeah, me too. I got um, half an hour a get, night. And then I would get in trouble and I would negotiate right. um, with them. <laughs> and I would say, okay, so you put me on restriction. Fine. Um, Melrose place is on and I can't miss Marlowe's place. So I'll take two days if I can watch this <laughs> Monday night you, at 8 o'clock. I will gladly trade you those Tuesday are still good. for a Melrose place tonight. Those right, are still and it good works. skills that you developed in the process. Without just a like, Negotiation. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I when I left, so the first time I was basically gone. I missed the the Clinton hearings. I missed like the mid-90s through the mid-2000s. I missed all that pop culture. 
And it was like an alien when I came back. And there's 10 years of my, you know, there's a big chunk of my life where I can't follow along a conversation once people, like I, I'm not part of that collective culture in my own country. Is that a I disadvantage? That. Um, I mean, it isn't, yeah. I mean, it is in some ways. I, I miss some I miss some cues. I mean, obviously I'm, I can follow along, but to me, this is why you don't, you, you, you can rage against the machine without um, cutting right. yourself off of the lifeblood that is the culture of Completely. the place where you're living. Right. That's um, good. I like it. So again, it's like this, but, but we don't, somehow we've lost our ability to be flexible in how we think about stuff. It's yeah. either all or nothing. You, it's like, and then there's plenty of parents that, you know, we go out to dinner and they plop their kids down with a, and I'm sorry if people listening to this are a family like this, but almost um, everybody you know, is. I should just they plop point their out. <laughs> kids down with a with a screen, and that's how they do their dinner. I never uh, judge parents because it's such a hard job, and yeah, no, and you shouldn't, and that's yeah. an excellent way to get trolled. So yeah. I'm not judging; I'm just stating. Uh, and there are parents who do completely the opposite, which is uh, nobody gets any screen time ever. I just give my kid a five pound bag of sugar free gummy bears, <laughs> and I said, kid. Enjoy <laughs> and watch as much TV as you can. <laughs> and I'll see you later. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by WordPress. I'll tell you one thing, uh, and I think this is true of uh, your daughter. Not yet, but there at some point, uh, you. the other thing you have to decide with kids is, uh, is their presence on the Internet. Because you can't keep a kid off or anybody off the Internet because that vacuum will be filled. It'll just be filled by other people's posts about your child, videos about your child, name calling, and all sorts of stuff. So I always tell teenagers, and I think it's right about seventh or eighth grade, get a website, start putting your best stuff on it. This is going to be you when people Google your name. So this is something you need to do. And it's true for individuals. It's true for businesses. You need to have a website. And that's why I always tell people about WordPress.com because it's the easiest a free way to create your website right now that will become who you are. In fact, my suggestion is, you know, if you're having a kid, get their domain name now, register it. I did for my kids. Got a 20-year domain name registered. I figured by then they'd know if they wanted it. Uh, get their email accounts. Start this, start this process right now. The minute Matt Mullenweg announced it, I started using it for my blog, and I've used it ever since. I've been on WordPress.com for 12 years because... Let them do the hard work. Let them do the hosting, the tech support. You know, you probably heard uh, about uh, some WordPress security flaws that somebody was just releasing into the wild this week uh, without any warning. Hey, don't worry. WordPress.com takes care of that stuff so you don't have to constantly follow all the security bulletins and make sure you're safe. You are safe. You're on WordPress.com. WordPress.com was started by Matt many years ago so that anyone could publish their ideas, have their voice on the web, put a portfolio up, open a store, start a blog, let people know about your business. And it's a site that's free to start but can grow with you all the way up to an e-commerce site and some of the biggest publications in the world. They're, they're using WordPress.com. No two-week trials, no hidden fees. And most importantly, you own your content forever. Sure, it's fine for your kid to have a Facebook page or an Instagram site or a Snapchat, whatever. But it's so important for you as an individual and for every business to have a, one place that's yours, that you own forever. Upload anything you want, text, pictures, video, audio. Download it again and get it out. It's never trapped. And a great customer support team. They're not just page turners in a notebook. They're actually WordPress lovers and users and experts. And they're there 24 hours a day to help you, even weekends. The WordPress platform is powerful and flexible. It can grow as big as you need it to be, but it can start as small as you want. Millions of people use WordPress.com every day to turn their dreams into reality. In fact, the number that blows me away every time I read it, 33% of the entire internet is powered by WordPress. One third of all the internet runs on the WordPress software. The best way to do it, WordPress.com. Go to WordPress.com slash twit. You'll get 15% off any new plan purchase right now. WordPress.com slash twit. 15% off any new plan purchase. WordPress.com slash twit. Please go there so that they know you heard it here. That helps us, and we thank you, WordPress, for uh, for me personally, 12 years of leolaporte.com. Um, would you? I, I would imagine, given how sophisticated you are with your kid, uh, Amy, that... Uh, a website would be something you would do at some point too, right? 
Do you agree so, with what I said about you've got to put yourself out there so that you control yeah. your reputation? So um, I guess I'll just, we're all getting to know each other tonight. Why not, right? Um, <laughs> so, so we created a digital trust fund uh, for her when she was born, which means that I registered her, you know, I've got her domain, I've got her social media names locked up and accounts and I keep adding to it, um, but we don't post anything. So yeah, she's, but you have she's got it when she's ready. Um, yeah. And then the thing you know. I wish I had thought of, of course, there was no Gmail at the time. My kids are 24 and 27. But I love this idea. Somebody told me about this years ago. Maybe it was um, uh, one of the geek dads. Get a Gmail account when your baby's born, start sending yep. stuff to it, and then give her the keys to the account when she's, you know, 18 or 21, yep. whatever you think is appropriate. I think that's a, I love that idea. That's the best baby yeah. book ever, right? Yeah. Technology could be, if you think about it, it could be used well. I, I wish you'd write a book or something. And, and on parenting, are you crazy? <laughs> I years ago, no, 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 like this is. There's like, I would rather uh, talk all day long about any other hot button issue you I can know, imagine. It's the hardest thing in the world. Um, isn't it? Parenting is the easiest way to invite lots of trouble into your life. Um, so, you know, another way talk about politics, but I'm going to have to do it. The House has voted to save net neutrality, and the White House is, of course, going to veto it. I feel like I have whiplash. Yeah, this goes back yeah, and forth, except it really it's doesn't constant. go back and forth. It's really, they have they eliminated it, and now they're just fighting and fighting and fighting uh, yeah. to get it back. Meanwhile, state, meanwhile the states are, are going ahead and passing their own resolutions. Right. And so the issue, and of course, you know, that's problematic too because the internet is a global phenomenon. It's absolutely no, you're not wrong. I'm just saying I, I'm glad I live in the state hey, some, of Washington. Yes, so at the very least, you have the best. You, know, until, you have the best law of all, right? Right. So at least until this is all figured out, I don't have to worry about you know my ISP being given information, um, regardless of what the federal statutes are. So, so you're going to hear like from the White House when they veto it because they will. The Save the Internet mm -hmm. Act. Uh, you're going to hear stats that are essentially bogus. Um, since the new rule was adopted in 2018, consumers have benefited from a greater than 35% increase in average fixed broadband download speeds. And we went from 13th to 6th in the world. Uh, by the way, even that's nothing to celebrate. In 2018, fiber was also made available in more new homes than any previous year. Capital investment by the nation's top six internet service providers increased $2.3 billion dollars. Um, some of this, of course, has been ongoing for years. Um, anyway, there's a good Verge article that debunks a lot of these claims and it'd probably be worth reading it. And let's not give up the fight for net neutrality because we know that that's something that has to happen. 23 state attorneys general are uh, filing lawsuits, have filed lawsuits in state by state, of course, including Washington state. Uh, states are enacting their own net neutrality. So that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> that means we're going to wind up with uh, one, one, of the, one of the tech trends we talked about and modeled a couple years ago was um, splinter nets, which yeah. is not a trend that I made up. But I mean, it's just, again, like mm -hmm. this is so stupid. Like with, yep. the last thing you want now is to have a state by, like to, is to like have the states figure out how to handle Absolutely. this. Absolutely. How do you, like, what does that do for business? Like, that's just when internet stupid data thing. crosses state lines. <laughs> What happens to it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, no, it, it, I mean, and it's happening on international levels too, right? Like with, with some of the different proposals oh, look at this one. countries are yeah. coming up with. Like, I lived in Philly for a while. Is this going to be a thing where you like sneak I'm on the Philly internet. Hey. You know, the yeah, Philly like, internet's like, oh, the best internet. You over to like, like Texas to get slightly better. Like you're going to change your IP so that you're like 10 miles away. Now we have a good use for VPNs. <laughs> no, well, seriously. 50 well, servers, I mean, one for each state. You choose the internet you how want. How does that not wind up happening? No, that's right? totally what's going to wind up happening and unless we can have an administration change and then roll back, you know, this stuff and then the, the FCC can do what it should be doing, which is to, you know, like protect people and not just hand everything over to the ISPs. Although as a classic example of what could possibly go wrong, the <laughs> French internet referral unit has reported to archive.org 550 of their oh, yeah. archived urls as terrorist contents uh -huh. falsely i might add 
Um, yep. Take down notices from the French IRU for a bunch, including, by the way, the Gutenberg, Smithsonian, the Grateful Dead. <laughs> well, actually, the Grateful Dead might be considered terrorists to certain government agencies. I don't know. Um, crazy. What? What crazy. is possibly? What was in that C-SPAN report? Like, what was? Who was holding up what post? What floor chart? <sighs> That was deemed a... <laughs> the problem is with the EU's laws, um, you don't you you get less than twenty four hours to respond. The archive.org is 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 panicking. That's totally not the way that they intended. No, there's a one sort. hour. I'm sorry, did I get it? I, I exaggerated. There's a one hour requirement. You have to take those URL down immediately. You have one hour to do so. Or it, what? Or, uh, or somebody comes and yells at you Somebody comes sternly? and hits you with a baguette. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'll um, take that baguette. <laughs> I'll take that baguette. Uh, the French Internet Referral Unit falsely identified hundreds of URLs on archive.org as terrorist propaganda. Um, the one-hour requirement means... By the way, there was no one there when they came in. It was on the weekend. Uh, it's a It's a mistake. Uh, blocking procedures may be implemented against us, says archive.org, if we don't remove the content. So they'll be blocked in France. <laughs> Splinternet. That's the in the. We what do not want our. We do not want a the balkanization of our of our tech and our digital right. infrastructure. This gives extraordinary power to authoritarian regi regimes uh, who would love to see us fighting these stupid, dumb. I mean, just these, th th this is just a, again, this is like, this is why regulation often doesn't work. I mean, right. I understand why people, why we pursue it, but in practice, it doesn't work. And but you've we, been arguing for it all along. No, no, I've not been arguing for regulation. I'm very oh. much, um, I think the blunt instrument of regulation is the, is the, not the smart way forward. The, the smart way forward is to come up with something we don't have yet, which I know is much more difficult. Um, but we've got to figure out a way to collaborate. Where again, you know, we have three like epicenters of power, at least in this country: Wall Street, D.C., and our West Coast capital, which is the Valley slash Bellevue. You know, hmm. and we've got to figure out a way to get them to collaborate. Oh uh, my God, we're screwed. Well, I'm just saying, like, otherwise, it's not going to happen. <laughs> No, but regulation is bad, and this is another one of these things oh. where, like, this kind of regulation because it doesn't make sense. I mean, look, look no, you just crazy. read it to us. No, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and France doing its own thing and all of these different companies now and countries coming up with their own policies and value statements around all different types of technology, including AI. There's an evangelical group of Christians who have now come up with a Christian stance on what AI should be. <laughs> oh, God. So I, what the val, what, like, the, this is my point. Like, we're all going about this. We're all, we're all doing our own thing. And, and what happens when everybody's individual interests wind up colliding, which they're going to, you know, then you wind up with a takedown notice for floor charts shown on C-SPAN. It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I really, uh, there's so many great stories, but we've gone way too long. So we're going to have to wrap it up. I really did want to talk about the secret service agent when they arrested that Chinese woman who had four passport, no, two, three, yeah. four phones. She's the malware. Malware, malware, a malware and a USB stick about the Secret yeah. Service agent who plugged it into a machine to see what was on it. But we'll just save that for another I, day. I bet that, was, that a, was that a male or a female agent? Does it who matter? Plugged it in? Do we know? Yes, it does. It because I bet you that person has a lot of sex without condoms. <laughs> Samuel Ivanovich, uh, who was the first person to interview Jiang at Mar-a-Lago, testified that, uh, oh, no, he didn't. So he didn't do it. Another agent put Jiang's thumb drive into his computer huh. and immediately huh. began like to install files. A very out-of-the-ordinary event he had That's never seen thing. happen what before. What are you doing? Oh, my God. This is from the Miami Herald. Oh, my God. Well, maybe we don't. What well, we don't know, maybe it was a very special personal computer that wasn't connected to the internet or something. I mean, we can hope, but like, 
I meet some, I, I arrest somebody for suspicion on something. I'm totally just going to take their thumb drive and plug it into my computer. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, of course. That's the very first thing I'm going to do. I'm, I, <sighs> the, 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 it start, immediately began to install files, a quote, very out of the ordinary event he had never <laughs> seen happen before during this kind of analysis. Analysis? Oh my God. What is it? The analysis? Let's open it and see what happens. The agent had to immediately stop the analysis to halt any further corruption of his computer. The analysis <laughs> is still ongoing but inconclusive. I don't think they know what analysis means. I think it's your brother in law. No, I was going to say. <laughs> your dad. All right. Totally <laughs> my dad. It's totally my dad. <laughs> well, let's see what's on it. <laughs> let's see what happens. You, you know, you can turn off auto run. I'm just saying. Exactly. That EXE, what does that mean? Excellent. I should click on it. <laughs> All right. Enough, enough. I am so happy to have you two on here. We we decide normally we have a four-person panel. We said, no, no, Christina Warren, Amy Webb, that's all we need. That's a show. And I absolutely it proved true. Uh, Christina is the greatest. Uh, we've known her since the good old days of Mashable, senior developer advocate, cloud developer advocate at Microsoft now. Catch her at uh, the Ignite Tour coming soon to a town near you. Yes. Uh, and on Channel 9, you do stuff there too, right? I sure do. Uh, YouTube.com slash Microsoft developer. Nice. Sure so you are on YouTube. You are a YouTube She's star. She's a YouTube star. Oh, <laughs> I'm a YouTube star for, for you know, geeks, nerds. The best, yeah. the best audience. At, Without a doubt. At, or an influencer. She's an influencer. <laughs> of course she is. And always glad to have you. Thank you for keeping the lights on late at night yes. in Redmond. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Are you rushing off to watch Game of Thrones? We have how many hours? Yes. Happy Game hour. of Thrones yes. Eve. An hour. Now they put it out on, if you have HBO Go, you can watch it early, right? That's what I'm, uh, which is yeah, what I'm doing. Exactly. So on it's, East Coast, so. so in one hour, and you could watch it right now, Amy. Yeah, I'm, in fact, if I don't leave pretty soon, I'm going to get... Uh, Are you having a party? Yelled at. Is, uh, is your, party is, of two. Is, is your, your eight, you don't let your eight-year-old watch Game of Thrones. It's not on the... <laughs> it's, not, it's blocked That's by the great provision. firewall of Amy. You don't provision. No, not provision. No, I don't blame you. <laughs> All right. Oh, maybe, maybe, Amy yeah. Webb, the author of The Big Nine. You got to read this great book. And always welcome on our, uh, on our air. You can find out more at the Future Today Institute, or just go to amyweb.io. And I'm glad to know you're on Keybase. I did not know that. I will I will figure out your handle and follow you. I Good am, luck. I am, yeah, I searched for Amy <laughs> Webb. I didn't find it. I'm, <laughs> you could follow me. I'm Leo Laporte. Keybase, everybody who's a geek should know about keybase.io. It's free, and it's an amazing service. I use their encrypted Git for all my private stuff. Uh, it's fantastic yeah. and great yeah, it's encrypted awesome. chat. Keeps it your PGPs, great. keys, and all that stuff. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Christina. Thanks. What a great show Thank to come so back much. to. This is actually better than Kauai. No, You're it's lying. Not. Thank you. Thank you for saying it's that. It's better You're than lying. the luau we saw last night. I'll say that. that How about that? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon around right about 2.15, right after the radio show. That's 2.15 Pacific, 5.15 Eastern Time. That's about, oh, I don't know, 2120 UTC, something like that. Come by and watch uh, twit.tv slash live. There's a live audio and video stream so you can watch or listen. If you're doing that, chat room is a great place to hang out. They're watching and listening live too. It's irc.twit.tv. Everybody, even Amy's daughter, will feel safe there. It should be part, <laughs> it should be inside the great firewall of Amy. Uh, if you want to watch us in studio, you're more than welcome to do so. We had a great uh, live audience from all over the world, from Australia and, uh, oh, I don't know, let's see, Connecticut, <laughs> uh, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and Mountain View. Uh, please come and uh, join us. Just email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a chair out for you. You can also get on-demand versions of everything we do at our website, twit.tv, or best idea yet, subscribe in your favorite podcast application. That way you won't miss an episode. You'll have it in time for your Monday commute. Enjoy Game of Thrones, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Another twit is in the can. Bum, 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 bum.